what else I should do to ensure that the work of members is not undermined in this way. The gentleman giving me notice that he wished to raise this matter. It certainly does seem that the it is certainly unsatisfactory if a department provides less information in a response to a parliamentary question from an elected member of this House than it provides in response to a freedom of information request from an external body. There's a basic issue here of, if I may say so, parliamentary self respect and so we've all got a dog in this race if I can put it that way. I understand that the Honourable Gentleman has written on this matter to the procedure committee which is exactly the course that I would recommend in these circumstances. That committee colleagues plays an important role in monitoring both the quality and the timeliness of parliamentary answers. I'm glad to see that that proposition is assented to by the Honourable Gentleman Member for Scunthorpe, who has himself been a distinguished ornament of that committee and may be willing to make representations to the Home Secretary on the Honourable Member's behalf. Meanwhile, the Honourable Gentleman has put his concern on the record and I hope that it has been noted on the Treasury bench and will be conveyed to Home Office Ministers. I hope that is helpful to the Honourable Gentleman. We now come to the emergency debate in which, and before the three hours starts, in which, subject only to the constraints of time and the willingness of colleagues to help each other, my main ambition is to try to maximise participation. We come to the emergency debate. Mr Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and if I may, I want to commend all those that were involved in trying to save the iconic Mac building in the early hours of yeah, Saturday yeah, morning. Yeah, and if I may yeah, commend yeah. my honourable friend from Glasgow Central, who I know attended to make sure that her constituents were safe, and grateful thanks to the fire service and, of course, the fact that they are all safe from this great tragedy for all of us. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I would like to start by thanking you for granting time for this very important debate on the issue of the EU withdrawal bill devolution and the Seoul Convention. And I should also mention that some members of the Scottish Select Committee can't be here today as they're hearing evidence elsewhere. I know that many of the committee members would have wanted to contribute to the debate if they were here. I am grateful, Mr Speaker, that you have granted this debate, but it is not a substitute. for the absolute failure of the UK Government yep. to allow appropriate time for debate on the withdrawal bill and the failure of the UK Government to protect devolution. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Make no mistake, the events of last week demonstrated the utter arrogance and the contempt that the UK Government has for the devolved nations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Scotland's voices were silenced. Yep. Whilst the Secretary of State for Scotland stood by and did nothing as the UK Government enacted a grab on the powers of the Scottish yeah. Parliament. It is notable, Mr Speaker, that the Secretary of State for Scotland is apparently not leading for the UK Government in this debate. Can the Minister please tell us why the Secretary of State for the Scotland Office is not leading for the Government in this debate? when we are discussing Relegated. Scotland's devolved institutions. Relegated. He is the Secretary of State for Scotland. He should face up to the debate on the power grab. He cannot hide from what has been a failure to protect Scotland and to protect devolution. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mr Speaker, where is the leadership? He should have insisted on speaking in this debate, which is, after all, a debate about his ability, or more importantly, lack of ability to depend the powers of the Scottish Parliament. Is the Secretary of State for Scotland yellow? Will he stand up and defend the interests of Scotland? Perhaps the Secretary of State hasn't got the gall to do so, particularly when we know that the Secretary of State for Scotland came to this House and said from the dispatch box that amendments would be put, that members of Parliament in this chamber would have the ability to discuss 
what was happening. None of that ever happened. Yeah. Why was it that the Secretary of State for Scotland promised that we would have that engagement yeah, yeah. with Members of Parliament? And he failed, failed miserably, to make sure that Scotland's MPs had the ability to debate this important issue. Yeah. When he did not bother to show up last week, we saw the Secretary of State come to this chamber seeking to justify the attack on the Scottish Parliament, claiming, claiming that these are not normal times. Of course, these are not normal times, because this government... is acting against the interests of the people right across the UK rather than acting in their best interests. I will happily give way. I am very grateful to the Vice Chairman. I have to say in passing, it is a bit rich for him to say that uh, he was gagged when he put the gag on himself by stomping out with his throat. But I, I, I do wonder, I do wonder what, what the Right Honourable Gentleman has to say, because this is an important point that we are debating. When the architect of the convention, Lord Sewell himself, has said, I do not think it can fairly be described as a power grab because the legislation itself, establishing the Scottish Parliament, says quite explicitly that it does not affect the power of the UK Parliament to make laws for Scotland. It is absolutely clear that sovereignty yes. rests with the Parliament yes. of the United Kingdom. Yes. Can I just say, order, 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 order. The Honourable Gentleman should resume his seat. Can I just gently say intervention should be brief? Mr Ian Blackford. I think what the Honourable Men Member has identified is that there is no defence of the rights and the powers of yeah. the yeah. Scottish yeah. Parliament. Yeah. What has been proven by the events of the last week, that the Sewell Convention, sadly, is unworkable. Yeah. And we've got the ridiculous situation that the Conservative Government, in the teeth of the opposition, from the Scottish National Party, from the Labour Party, from the Liberal Democrats, from the Greens, that have said that they do not support handing powers over to the government here in London, that the Conservative government have used the majority that they have from England to take powers back from the Scottish Parliament and the people of Scotland. That is the reality. Mr Speaker, what is happening is that the people of these islands have been dragged into political chaos, the chaos of Brexit, but it's not normal. But that is no justification for breaking the convention that states very clearly that the UK government should not normally legislate and devolve matters without the consent of the Scottish Parliament. What clearly is not normal is the attack on devolution by the Conservative government. That is what is not normal. The Scottish Parliament, that many fought so long and hard to establish, is being emasculated by an anti-Tory government here in London, anti-Scottish Tory government. We used to talk of the settled will of the Scottish people, not the will of the UK Parliament to grab powers from the Scottish Parliament against the will of the Scottish Parliament. Mr Speaker, the events of last week have shaken the very stability of our devolved settlement. And then the Secretary of State informs us that, in his opinion, Scotland is not a partner in the UK, but part of the UK. Despite the fact that the Prime Minister had claimed that she wanted, and I quote, a future in which Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and England continue to flourish side by side as equal partners. Mr Speaker, as equal partners. In one sentence, in the mind of the Secretary of State, we have been downgraded from a nation to a region, not the equal partnership that the Prime Minister talked about, but a subordinate relationship, a subordinate relationship that the Secretary of State for Scotland has acquiesced in. Not so much standing up for Scotland, but trampling over our parliamentary settlement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, I thank the Right Honourable Member for giving way. As members know, I am one of five former MSPs in this place, the other four being on the benches opposite, and I served in Hollywood for 12 years, 12 years that I am very proud of. I wonder if the Right Honourable Member would agree with me 
that one way out of this impasse, that we, one way we may learn for the future, is to put in place some kind of cross Parliament arbitration system involving members of this place and MSPs. We have Mr Alex Neal in another gallery events joining us from Hollywood today. I think that that would be one way to bring forward harmony and to work together for the good of the people of Scotland. We should learn from this. Can I, can I, can I thank my honourable friend for that very useful contribution? Of course, we have the Joint Ministerial Committee, but let's not forget that the Joint Ministerial Committee did not meet for six months last exactly. year. Yeah. It did not meet for six months because the Westminster government would not engage. And yeah, my honourable friend is, is, is quite correct. One second, now. My honourable friend is quite correct that there has to be respect of the Parliament, and I would argue that there has to be respect of all the political parties <laughs> yes. that represent our country, that represent our Parliament. I'll, I'll come to you in a second. I'm grateful to the right honourable gentleman for giving way. He refers to the Joint Ministerial Committee. But of course, that is a mechanism for communication between governments. Surely, what is required here is something I identified 15 years ago, and it is a formal mechanism for communication between parliaments. Because if the governments cannot be relied on to treat this seriously, then it is down to parliaments to fill that gap. Well, can I, 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 want to, I want to give credit to the other parties in the Scottish Parliament because there has been a strong level of engagement and I think we need to improve and enhance upon that and I'm, as a principal I'm very happy with uh, what my right honourable friend has, has said. I'm grateful, grateful to my uh, right honourable friend for giving way and I congratulate him on the very passionate speech he is making. Does he agree with me that uh, when the British Government is now dealing with Wales and Scotland in, in these very uh, sensitive discussions, uh, they be, uh, they'd do well to reflect on the wise words of Voltaire, uh, the great French philosopher who said, injustice in the end produces independence. Well, I am uh, very, very grateful for, uh, to be reminded of that particular quote. But, you know, I, I would say to the honourable members in the, in, in the government benches, be careful. Be careful. Because, because what, let me finish this point. This is not about the offence which is taken in this by the Scottish National Party, because you have to take on board that you have offended the Scottish Parliament. You have offended all the parties that I talked about. Now, all of us on these benches were back home in Scotland over the course of the weekend. And I can tell you, I can tell you that Scotland has changed. And there's been a very strong message which has come across that people that supported devolution, people that voted for devolution in 1997, can see very clearly what is going on. Yeah, however you want to try and define it, however you want to yeah. try and spin it, it is an attack on the powers of yeah. the Scottish Parliament yeah. and teeth yeah. of the opposition yeah. of the Scottish yeah. Parliament and the Scottish people. Oh, and you will pay a heavy price, as you have paid in the past, if you don't listen to the voices of the Scottish people. I thank the honourable gentleman for giving way. The Honourable Gentleman will, will of course recall that the Conservative Party fought tooth and nail against the re-establishment of a Scottish Parliament. And what we see in the bench is opposite an apologist. Apologist! Order, 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 order. The House must calm down. There's too much noise. Mr Grant, you're a most amiable fellow. It's very unusual to see you very animated. And it's true that you are beaming, but you and Mr Graham are also in the process making a considerable cacophony. And I think it would be better if you would calm yourselves for now. Patricia Gibson. Opposing the establishment of the Scottish Parliament, and we see the apologists defending the undermining of devolution itself. Does the honourable gentleman agree with me that they are hostile to the very concept of devolution in the first place? Yeah. My, my honourable friend is, is quite correct. They have form which goes back over a course of a century. If, if I may, if I may, I, I would like to make some progress, and then I will allow uh, interventions to be made. Mr. Speaker, if the UK government has a free hand to argue and bend the rules to state when a situation is normal or not in order to undermine the Sewell Convention, then we can never, ever protect the powers of our Parliament. <laughs> Westminster can do as it pleases, and we have to take it. Our Parliament in Scotland, that is supposed to be permanent, can see its powers changed at the whim of Westminster here, to here. finding times yeah. as not normal. Can the Secretary of State for Scotland 
not see what is wrong with that. The Secretary of State for Scotland is there to defend Scotland's interest, and he can simply put his hands up that times are not normal and powers over fishing, <laughs> over agriculture, over the environment, and so many other areas which are defined in the Scotland Act as devolved are then taken back into Westminster. The UK Government has got this wrong. Last week, Scotland recognised that there was a power grab against our Parliament, a power grab taking place when Scottish members of the UK Parliament were not even allowed to debate the matter. The devolution settlement ripped up with no debate. Where is the democracy in Scotland's Parliament having its power stripped, and yet Scotland's MPs don't get the here, chance to speak? Here, here, here. On that point, I'm I'm grateful to the right honourable gentleman for giving way. And could he take this opportunity to confirm to the House when he says this side opposed uh, devolution in 1997, his own party opposed devolution in 1997 because their only aim is separation of Scotland from the rest of the United Kingdom. And when he speaks about a power grab, can he tell me how many powers the Scottish Parliament currently has and how many it will have after this government enacts its legislation? Because he knows it will be considerably more. That was no answer. No answer. Miles offside. Yeah, to use a football term, miles offside. Yeah. If he actually, if he actually looked back on Google and he looked at what my party had done in the 1979 devolution campaign, where we worked collectively with everybody else in 1997, and I can I can tell the honourable gentleman that I was tramping the streets of Scotland together with all my colleagues to make sure that Scotland could get its parliament. And of course, the Scottish people, the Scottish people voted overwhelmingly for that parliament, and one of the reasons they did so is because we had suffered so badly from the years of a Thatcher and a major government that destroyed communities up and down the land. And it's little wonder that the Tories then paid a price when they were wiped off the political landscape in Scotland. And what we see, what we see today is that the Scottish Conservatives are behaving exactly as they did in the past. And I make this prediction, you will pay a price again. Because what you've done is you have stopped the Scottish Parliament and the people of Scotland in the back by taking these powers back. Mr. Speaker. Speaker. Scotland is watching. And it is not just the supporters of the SNP who are alarmed. Those that cherish our Parliament are outraged, outraged by the attacks on Scotland's Parliament. It's really, I have to say, it is what? illuminating the behaviour that we're seeing. We should have a respectful debate, which others have called for. I will. I will happily say to members that I, have, I am generous in allowing interventions as I take from all sides of the House, but this behaviour of braying and shouting yeah. 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 does nobody any favour, and you really, really ought to, sorry, you, the, all the members of the government mentions, yeah. really ought to think yeah. about their behaviour yes. and yeah. how this comes Absolutely. across yeah. to the people Absolutely. of Scotland. Yeah. 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 Mr Speaker, Absolutely. the mood in Scotland has changed. There is a widespread recognition that the Conservatives have reverted to type and they are attacking devolution. Nay, they are attacking the interests of the people of Scotland. I will give way. The right honourable, right honourable gentleman for giving way. Last week, when we divided on the Lord's amendments, this side of the House voted for a government voted for more powers for more powers for the Scottish Parliament. By you voted against. Sorry, the. The SNP, Mr Speaker, voted against. They voted against additional powers for the Scottish Parliament. We voted for more powers for the Scottish Government. They voted against those powers. Dear oh dear oh dear oh dear oh dear. I know I would simply say that he should listen and watch what the reaction is in Scotland because everybody knows that what he and his colleagues did last week was vote for through the, go through the lobbies to vote to strip powers from the Scottish Parliament yeah. and do it 
and do it without having a debate in this place. Right. He really, Absolutely. really, really ought to be Absolutely. ashamed of himself. Let's, um, let's remind ourselves, since the Tories like to talk about referendums, that 74% of those that voted in our referendum in 1997 voted for a Scottish Parliament. Our Parliament, it belongs to all of us. We should not forget that since a Home Rule Bill introduced into this Parliament in 1913, right up to 1997, the Tories opposed devolution. The Tories have form in standing up against the Scottish Parliament. The remarks from the Secretary of State for Scotland that we are not a partner within the UK is simply a confirmation as how he sees Scotland's place. It is little wonder that he fails to stand up for Scotland as a country, fails to stand up for our Parliament. He sees us as subservient. That's the nub of the problem, and that's why the Secretary of State for Scotland needs to go. The Secretary of State, quite simply, is unfit for the office which he holds. He can't fight Scotland's corner because he won't fight Scotland's corner. By ignoring the Scottish Parliament during the passage of the EU Withdrawal Bill, the UK Government has risked the security of the devolution settlement. Mr Speaker, this is an extremely serious development. Well, Section 28.7 of the Scotland Act 1998 confirms that Westminster retains its unlimited sovereignty. The devolution settlement provides through the Sewell Convention that the legislative power will not be used if there is disagreement and the devolved legislators do not give consent. Mr Speaker, there has been no agreement. The Scottish Parliament voted by 93 votes to 30 not to consent to the EU withdrawal. Why did not the Secretary of State for Scotland stand up for the Scottish Parliament? Why does not he get Parliament, grow some backbone and stand up for Scotland? Mr Speaker, the UK Government's own website states the main role the main role of the Scottish Secretary is to promote and protect the devolution settlement. My goodness, he's been found wanting on that one. Whilst the Secretary of State has not done very well with defending devolution, he is the one that wants to kick away the legs from the agreed settlement. What a disgrace. He has been a dismal failure on living up to the definition that the Government has stated to protect devolution. The Secretary of State has ambushed devolution. At every turn, he has failed to defend the devolution settlement. Where are the amendments he promised to protect our interests? He should have told the UK Government that there must be protected time to debate the effect of the withdrawal bill on Scotland's position. He failed again. The Secretary of State for Scotland has no credibility. There is no coming back from this. He must resign, or the Prime Minister must sack him. Mr Speaker, the EU withdrawal bill is the biggest attack on devolution we have ever witnessed. The UK Government's power grab aims to keep Scotland's powers in London, not in Scotland. As currently drafted, the legislation would keep devolved powers coming back from Brussels here in London. It is shocking. 24 powers in devolved areas like fishing, agriculture, the environment and food labelling. This, Mr Speaker, is an absolute scandal. Thank you very much to the right hon. Member. Um, I wonder if you would like to comment on his uh, uh, party colleague, Jim Sillers, who said, lays the blame clearly at Nicola Sturgeon's feet of a display of foolish hostility. Is that not exactly what he is doing? Does he not respect there are two governments in Scotland and the Scottish people elected two governments? Surely he must show that some respect. Mr Speaker, I think some of the honourable gentlemen opposite should, should, should be auditioning for comedy hour. Let me just remind the honourable gentlemen. The Conservatives have lost every single election in Scotland since 1955. But what they want to do is to put a veto on the Scottish Parliament and the people of our country. That's the reality. Mr Speaker, Powers must be in Scotland's hand, and it's not just the SNP that are saying it. Every party, every party 
with the exception of the Conservatives, yep. has stood up to defend Scotland's Parliament. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. A recent survey by 38 degrees showed that. My goodness, my goodness, the contempt. The I know contempt. The contempt the people, people. 38 degrees do a valuable job of making sure that our constituents keep us informed yeah. of what's important for them. But what we get is mocking contempt from the party opposite. Just keep it going. Keep it going, because people in Scotland are watching your behaviour. They're watching your behaviour. Mr Speaker, a recent survey by 38 degrees showed that 62% of Scots agree and want to see responsibilities over devolved areas currently held by Europe transferred straight to the Scottish Parliament. Legal experts such as Professor Rick Rawlings also criticised the EU withdrawal legislation for riding roughshod over devolution. He said, the sooner Clause 11 of the Withdrawal Bill is cast aside, the better. Constitutionally maladrat, it wraps the dialogue about the role and place of the domestic market concept post-Brexit. John Downey at the Scottish Council of Voluntary Organisations has also advocated for powers to return to Scotland, not London. He said, we have consistently pushed to enhance the powers of devolved parliaments when it makes sense to do so and believe more devolved powers would be better enable Scottish and Welsh ministers to react to unique regional challenges and shape tailored solutions. We feel the transfer of powers to the devolved administrations would make it easier for the sector to influence their use in a positive way. The STUC, their leader Graham Smith, has also yep. warned the UK government must accept the legitimacy of devolved institutions yep. and realise that proposals which create a situation where the UK could legislate in any area of devolved competence without the agreement of the Scottish Parliament would be an erosion of devolution and would not be acceptable. Will my honourable friend give way on that point? I will happily give way. Thank my honourable friend for giving way. Does my honourable friend agree with me that the Tory government re-reservation of powers and the rest of their preferred post-Brexit constitutional arrangements effectively strip the decisions about fracking from the Scottish Government? And if the decision of the future of fracking in Scotland is to be made in Whitehall, does he agree with me that the Secretary of State for Scotland's office has been permanently undermined, no matter who occupies that office? Yeah. 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 My honourable friend makes a very valuable point. He is absolutely correct. And absolutely. We have to be very careful about the threats that there are to Scotland from fracking. And of course, we should remember that Scotland is an energy rich country. We have a wide number of different energy sources the world leading in renewable sources, and yet we have a government in London that wants to bash ahead and risk ruining Scotland's environment. We can't stand aside and allow that to happen. I will give way. Yeah. Thank the Royal Gentleman for giving way. He correctly points to 24 powers. Can he explain which ones of those create a constitutional outrage? And assuming it is some, why then did his colleagues in the Scottish Government agree to each and every one of those 24 being subject to a UK wide framework back in December? Yeah. Can I respectfully suggest? It's supposed to be good. Can I, it's it's supposed to be good. You've got to be kidding. Can I respectfully suggest that the honourable gentleman goes back and he reads the Scotland Act 1998? Because the Scotland Act. You know, I can I can see people shaking their head. I can see people shaking their head. But this is actually the nub of the problem that devolution and the Scottish Parliament is defined by that legislation. Yep. And that legislation defines what is devolved and what is reserved. And the simple fact of the matter is each of these 24 areas are devolved. They belong in the Scottish Parliament. Now, what the Scottish Government has said repeatedly, that we will sit down, we want to reach agreement with the UK Government, but that agreement has to be based on mutual respect. We will not unreasonably withhold consent on setting up framework agreements, yeah. but it has to be done on the basis of the consent of yes. the Scottish yeah. Government yeah. Yeah. and the consent of the Scottish yeah. Parliament. Yeah. I cannot, for the life of me, understand why this is such a difficult concept to grab, and I have to say I am somewhat surprised and disappointed yes. in yeah. the yeah. Honourable yeah. Gentleman. Yeah. Mr Speaker, yeah. last week Scotland's voices were silenced and ignored. Because, 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 because we walked out 
Is that, is that the fact, is it? That's the fact. Well, I have to say to the honourable gentleman that what happened on Tuesday night, and it's a matter of record, he can look it up in Hansard, is that he went through the lobbies to strip the Scottish Parliament of powers and not a single Scottish MP was allowed to debate the issue. That's the fundamental point. Mr Speaker, the behaviour of the UK Government is disgraceful. The Conservatives really think they can do whatever they want with Scotland and get away with it. It's back to the days of the poll tax under Thatcher. The very fact that they railroaded this legislation through with no time for speeches from anyone other than the UK Government Minister shows utter contempt for Scottish democracy. Now, I I regret the fact that the Secretary of State for Scotland is not down to speak tonight. I'm going to give him another opportunity. Stand up and defend the indefensible. He can't. He's sitting there playing with his iPhone, playing with his iPhone and stabbing the Scottish Parliament in the back. That's the reality. Come on. Come on, speak, speak up. Come on, speak up. Speak up. Uh, that was, order. That was a sort of rhetorical device by the honourable gentleman. <laughs> but it is up to the, the Secretary of State if he wishes to intervene. And, you know, one can't have people intervening against their will. And Mr. Ian Blackford. Yes. Thank you, Thank Thank you uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Mr. Speaker, uh, this this speech, uh, I suppose it can be called that by the right honourable gentleman, is not worthy of a response uh, from me in the tone. In the tone that he has set out, he calls for respect, but focuses entirely on the personal in his comments. This may be. This may be a performance for his uh, colleagues. It may be a performance for his core voters. It doesn't impress Scotland. Mr Speaker, I'll tell you what doesn't impress Scotland is a Secretary of State for Scotland that doesn't defend our Parliament. He should do the decent thing. He should do the honourable thing. He should resign and he should do it now. Mr Speaker, as SNP Minister Mike Russell said last week, it's been a dark day for devolution. Despite countless representations from the Scottish Government seeking to work with the UK Government to protect their interests, the intransigence of the Tory party has seen our concerns, our mitigations and our solutions blatantly disregarded and disrespected. That's the reality. While the UK Government accepted that Clause 15 of the EU Withdrawal Bill required the legislative consent of the Scottish Parliament, when consent was not given, the UK Government decided to ignore Scotland's democratic wishes. Last week, we saw the Secretary of State for Scotland come crawling to the Chamber to explain the UK Government's position after the SNP had exposed the Tory power grab. But rather, rather than reassure the people of Scotland that the UK Government was painful, absolutely, it's painful. It's painful that the people of Scotland are seeing their powers taken back from them. But rather than reassure the people of Scotland that the UK Government was committed to protecting our devolution settlement, the Scottish Secretary's statement effectively turned Sewell on its head by saying that if there is disagreement, that is no consent on a legislative consent motion, the UK Government can proceed to legislate. Mr Speaker, this is a cause for huge concern. And it is a pity that the Secretary of State for Scotland is clearly not that concerned or he would have made sure he was responding in this important debate today. Under the constitutional rules, this government should not proceed, should not proceed without Scotland's Parliament's consent. By constitutional convention and invariable practice since 1999, the Bill should not complete its Westminster stages in its current form without that consent. Despite the murmurings of the current Secretary of State, back in 2005, the Scotland Office stated that the UK Government consider that the continuation of the Convention is vital to the success of devolution. Uh Uh What has changed? The only thing that has changed is the Scottish Parliament has not given its consent, and the UK Government, showing utter disrespect, has decided to proceed. 
So, Chair, the Leader of the uh, SNP, we all heard the statement that the Secretary of State gave to this House on Thursday morning. I wonder if he could give a commitment on behalf of the Scottish Government and indeed his party that if the Secretary of State was to convene uh, cross-party talks, that his party would take part. Yes, I, I mean, but one of the things I would say to the, and I thank him for his, his, his intervention. One of the things I say to the honourable gentleman and to the government across the other side, I don't believe it's in anybody's interest not to have an agreement on this. Mm -hmm. But all of us have got the responsibility of defending the powers and the interests of the Scottish Parliament. I implore the Secretary of State to get back round the table. Let's resolve this issue. I don't want us to be in the situation that the government in London is taking back responsibility for our powers. And they really must listen to the voices which are coming from around this chamber and indeed from around Scotland. I will, I will give way one last time. I thank my honourable friend for giving way. He's making a very powerful a very powerful speech which I am happy to associate myself with, but I also know from speaking to constituents at the weekend that many of them will associate themselves with these points. Yeah. The sense of outrage which was coming across from constituents in my area was only last, the last time I saw such outrage was during the opposition to the Iraq war and to the poll tax. And does my honourable friend agree with me that Scotland has now reached a tipping point as a result of the actions of the party opposite? Yeah. My, my honourable friend is quite correct, and it's borne out with my own experiences over honour. the course of the last few days. And we only have to look at the increase in membership of the Scottish National Party. And there are people, people coming to the SNP, people that have not supported the SNP previously, have not supported Scottish independence, but they are simply appalled that there's an attack on the Scottish Parliament, that there's an attack on, on devolution. And I'll simply say to the Secretary of State, by all means, carry on down the road that you're going on because the people of Scotland ultimately will have to make that decision as to where their future lies. And what he's doing, as he continues to go down this road, is to help strengthen the case for Scottish independence. Yeah, I, yeah, I suppose yeah, yeah. we should be grateful for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mr Speaker, last week the UK Government had a duty to amend the Bill to respect the will of the Scottish Parliament. They failed to do so. Whilst SNP MPs sought to be constructive with our amendments to the legislation, we were shut out of the debate while the Tories ploughed ahead without any consideration of our proposed solution. The complete contempt shown for the people of Scotland by the Tory Government is sickening. Not only were our amendments ignored, the entire debate on devolution was allocated less than 20 minutes of discussion, with no Scottish MP allowed to speak up for their constituents. Instead, the UK Government Minister ate up all the time for himself. The Scottish Tories <laughs> said they would come here to stand up for Scotland, but well, what did he do? They trooped through the lobbies yep. to take away Scotland's powers. Yep. Theresa May's poodles whipped to vote against yep. Scotland's interests. Yep. Scotland was aghast. The actions of the UK government have been an affront to democracy. I thank my Honourable Friend for giving way, and I congratulate him, first of all, for securing the debate and also for his fantastic speech. When it's clear. <laughs> When it's clear that in the Scottish Parliament you have the Labour Party in Scotland, the Liberal Democrats in Scotland, and the SNP, the Scottish Greens on the one side and the Tories on the other, that on this issue it has become Scotland versus the Tories. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of the line, uh, the line where the woman is watching her son on parade and they're saying they're all out to step apart from your Johnny, except in this case Johnny is the Scottish Tories. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, when I confronted the Prime Minister over the shambolic handling of the EU withdrawal bill by her government, we were given more bluff and bluster. Mr Speaker, it is not good enough. Over the past few days, I and my party colleagues have been criticised inside this place for standing up to the Prime Minister, for making our voices heard and for standing up for the people of Scotland. Mr Speaker, let me put the Prime Minister on notice. SNP MPs will not stand by while well, her government seeks to rip up the rule book. Yeah, yeah. This government does have an opportunity to do the right thing. With the clock ticking, we only have days left to save Scotland's devolved settlement. The solution I put to the Prime Minister last week is still on the table. That is that the Prime Minister should act immediately to bring forward emergency legislation to remove Clause 15 and Schedule 3 in line with the Scottish Parliament vote. That is the only way that the UK Government can undo the damage it has caused, and the only way that the Tories can show the people of Scotland that their Scottish Parliament's rights are recognised and respected. 
That is the only way that we can save devolution in Scotland. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, the Scottish Parliament has passed a continuity bill to protect its powers. Unbelievably, unbelievably, the Scottish Parliament has been taken to the Supreme Court by the UK Government over the matter. The UK Government should immediately withdraw this threat over the Scottish Parliament. Stop attacking our Parliament and start to show the Scottish Parliament some respect. The days of a UK Tory Government threatening Scotland must end. It is little wonder that the Tories once again are seen as anti-Scottish. Let me put this in a historic context. The campaign to establish the Scottish Parliament has been a long one. The Scottish Home Rule Association was established way back in 1894. There was a Scottish Government Bill that passed its second reading in 1913 that would have established a Scottish Parliament with greater powers than the one that we have today. Scotland voted in a referendum for a Scottish Parliament in 1979, but the incoming Tory Government refused to deliver the Scottish Parliament that Scotland had voted for. Right through the 1980s and 1990s, demand for a Scottish Parliament grew. These growing calls were ignored by the Conservatives until they were swept out of office. In 1998, the Scotland Act establishing a Scottish Parliament was passed in teeth of opposition from the Conservatives. Majority Scottish opinion demanded a Parliament. It was, as was stated, the the settled will of the Scottish people. When Winning Ewing rose to address the opening of the Scottish Parliament in 1999, she said, the Scottish Parliament which adjourned on March 25, 1707, is hereby reconvened. Yeah. That yeah. Parliament that we all in these benches take pride in had its powers defined by the Scotland Act. Schedule 5 of the Act defines what areas are reserved. The UK Government also accepts, and I quote, the Act does not specify which matters are devolved to the Scottish Parliament. Rather, it specifies those matters that are reserved to the UK Parliament. Those matters not reserved by the Scotland Act are devolved to the Scottish Uh Parliament. The Scottish Parliament has primary legislative powers, i.e. the powers to pass acts. That is clear cut. That is why, why, Mr Speaker, we cannot allow the Conservative Government to take back responsibility over 24 matters, which by the Scotland Act are devolved. It is wrong and we will do everything in our power to stop it. Yeah. Well, friend, for giving way, congratulate him on a stunning speech. Does he agree with me? But as the suffragette said, we shall be judged on our deeds, not our words, and that this government will be judged and shown up for the farce that it is. And the Secretary of State will be the first Secretary of State in history, Secretary of State for Scotland, that has seen a reduction in Scottish powers to the Scottish Parliament, and that this government will be judged. And the Scottish people will not forgive, nor will they forget. Yeah. I, I thank, I thank my honourable friend for, for that intervention, which is absolutely correct. There is a wonderful book called The Scottish Secretaries, and it talks about some of the great and some of the not so great Scottish <laughs> Secretaries. And when you reflect on people like Tom Johnson, that did so much to transform Scottish society, and then we look at the current Secretary of State. When we look at the current Secretary of State that fails to stand up for Scotland and sees our powers taken back. Now, if you want to stand up and tell me what's personal in that, what I'm doing is I'm focusing on the fundamentals. I'm focusing on the fundamentals that his party is working against the interests of the Scottish people and the Scottish Parliament and is, to use the phrase, taking back control. Mr Speaker, it is therefore simple. Westminster, without consent, is changing the devolution sentiment and is prepared to undermine the Scotland Act. None of us can stand back and allow this to happen. It is a point of principle. Westminster should not have a veto on the Scottish Parliament. Mr Speaker, it is pretty rich that last week we had accusations that Scotland was seeking a veto over Westminster. The Secretary of State has said that repeatedly. Let me be absolutely clear. That is not the case. All we are seeking to do is to ensure that the powers within the Scotland Act are defended, not dismantled. We have our own constitutional history, indeed, in the case of McCormick versus the Lord Advocate in 1953. 
When Lord Cooper gave his decision, he said, the principle of unlimited sovereignty of Parliament is a distinctly English principle, which has no counterpart in Scottish constitutional law. That is, that the people of Scotland are sovereign. Westminster must respect the will of the Scottish Parliament through its members, having been elected by the people of Scotland. I I should remind the UK Government that they have lost every single election in Scotland since 1955, and it is hardly surprising. The Conservatives are isolated in the Scottish Parliament and not standing up to defend our default rights. Mr Speaker, this is not about the SNP. It is about the settled will of the Scottish people and of the Scottish Parliament. History will judge all of us on our actions and at this time of critical and a challenging time. Therefore, I say to every Scottish MP in this place, do not fall on the wrong side. I say to the Secretary of State, stop hiding out and instead stand up with us and stand up for Scotland's Parliament. Stop the power grab or go down as the Secretary of State that allows Scotland's Parliament to have its powers reduced. History will remember the defining moment when this Parliament chose to reject devolution, when the Tories chose to stand almost ten years of constitutional convention only to tell the people of Scotland that their voices would be silenced. But I say again, there is a choice before the UK Government. Act now to bring in emergency legislation to recognise the Scottish Parliament and to protect our devolved settlement. Anything less risks constitutional crisis. Mr Speaker, we are days away. The clock is ticking. The Government must act. I urge the Government to choose to be on the right side of history, do the right thing by the people of Scotland and bring forward emergency legislation immediately to delete Clause 15 and Schedule 3 to protect Scottish devolution and our Scottish Parliament. In closing, I recall the powerful and pertinent words of Charles Stuart Parnell. No man has the right to fix the boundary of a march of a nation. No man has the right to say to his country, thus far shalt thou go and no further. The question is that this House has considered the validity of the Sewell Convention. Mr Alistair Jack. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I share the disappointment that has been expressed in the Chamber today that we were not given the opportunity to discuss these very important issues during the debate last week. However, my agreement with the member, of the, of the member for Ross Sky and Lacarbor on that point is where my, dis- where, where my agreement ends with him. It is worthwhile highlighting why it was the case that we didn't have time to de- debate last week. Eleven times last Tuesday, the Labour Party caused this House to divide. They knew exactly what the consequences of that were in terms of timings, but they persisted and sacrificed the time available for members to contribute to the debate. So I am delighted that we now have the opportunity to discuss the ramifications of new Clause 15 today. Mr Speaker, once we leave the European Union, the Scottish Parliament will be even more powerful than it is just now. And that is a fact. Every single one of being repatriated from Brussels after Brexit is already with Holyrood at implementation level. No power that currently resides there is being removed. We could be having a debate about how those powers could be used to improve the lives of fellow Scots, but instead, and not surprisingly, we're doing what the SNP love best and talking about process. Like my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Scotland, I regret that the Scottish Government were not able to agree a deal with the UK Government on the transfer of powers. But I have to be honest and say that I was not surprised. It really is questionable whether Nicola Sturgeon was ever going to do a deal in the first place. Because let's not forget that within hours of the EU referendum result being declared two years ago, Nicola Sturgeon summoned the media to Butte House and instructed her officials to start drawing up the necessary legislation for a second independence referendum. She knew fine well that a deal with the UK Government would have been detrimental to her plans for a rerun of 2014. Oh, he's giving away. <laughs> to the Honourable Gentleman giving away. Does he agree with Jim Sillers? 
a former mem- deputy leader of the Scottish National Party, when he says, let me be blunt, the standoff between Holyrood and Westminster is primarily the fault of Nicola Sturgeon. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Sensible man. That's why you phone Sam in Alex, Alex, Alex. Obviously, Obviously, I do agree with what he said, and I also agree with the comment of Jim Sillers. Order, order, order. order. Can I just explain to the House, people were talking about mutual respect, that it is discourteous for side conversations between members to take place when another member has the floor. The Honourable Gentleman for Stirling has just intervened, and he should then alert himself to the response to his intervention, rather than engaging in a squabble with Mr Law. Mr Alistair Jack. Mr Speaker, I also agree with Jim Siller's remark that it's ironic that Nicola Sturgeon wants to take the powers from Mrs May and return them straight to Mr Juncker. But there we are. Going back to, going back to the point I was making about the deal with the UK Government uh, that was detrimental to a planned rerun of the divisive second referendum proposed, Despite the best intentions of her Brexit minister, who I believe wanted to do a deal, the first minister would never have agreed to anything that he went back with. For them, it is all about grievance and division with Westminster, and the people of Scotland, Mr Speaker, are rightly sick of it. Once we leave the European Union, it is absolutely vital that the integrity of the unified internal market of the United Kingdom is upheld. That is of benefit to everyone, not least Scotland, where our trade with the rest of the UK is worth four times more than our trade with the EU. And in order to maintain that internal market, we need to agree common frameworks, something that even the SNP agree on. Mr Speaker, those frameworks will provide certainty to businesses in our home nations that will ensure there will be no barriers to doing trade within the UK, whether in areas such as agricultural support, animal welfare, environmental standards, food labelling or public procurement, common frameworks are required to ensure fairness throughout the UK, to maintain standards and to ensure cooperation between the four home nations. And as we leave the EU and become a global free trading nation again, common frameworks will ensure that the whole of the UK is able to benefit from the trade deals that will be signed with countries around the globe. Without those frameworks, we could end up with a different regulatory system throughout the UK which would potentially make it harder for us to sign comprehensive free de- trade deals. You would think that this would make complete sense, but it was not enough for the Scottish Government. They effectively wanted a veto over those powers contained in the frameworks, which it is important to bear in mind would also affect the people of England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And the UK Government were, to my mind, right not to give in to that demand. Mr Speaker, it just, isn't it just a little bit suspicious that a unionist government in Wales was able to sign up to the final deal, yes. but a nationalist yes. government in Scotland yes. was not? I don't think, I don't think it will escape the people of Scotland's notice that Nicola Sturgeon and the SNP have used this process to further their desire of taking Scotland back down the road of a divisive second independence referendum that the people of Scotland just don't want. Yeah. Yeah. If they, if they could, the SNP would take us straight back into the European Union, sign us back up to the hated common fisheries policy, and ironically hand the powers that are so contentious to them straight back to Brussels. Yep. However, Mr Speaker, we will not let that happen, and that is why this Government is respecting the democratic will of the British people to leave the European Union. Yeah. Yeah. Ian Murray. Mr Speaker, I'm very grateful, and it's a great pleasure to be involved in this uh, important debate and follow the member for Dumfries uh, and Galloway, although I would like to just take umbrage a little bit with the honourable member in the opening of his speech when he claimed that this debacle, which has actually been made by his own government, is somehow the, the fault of democratically elected politicians going down the lobbies to vote for Lord's amendments to what is a major piece of legislation. That is our democratic right, and many of my constituents, and I'm sure his, who wrote to him last week, would have been asking him to support the 15 amendments that came back from the other place, and that's certainly what we committed to do, and certainly what we did last week. The, the blame for only having 19 minutes to deal with these particular devolution issues lies squarely at the programme managers of the government, the Leader of the House, and the usual channels who decided 
to make it six hours with a knife at three hours, and that second three hours would be eaten into by votes. They could have taken a completely different approach uh, to the programme motion and allowed the votes to happen and the three hours to happen after that. This, is a, uh, uh, this travesty and this devastation and the grievance that has been given to certain parties in this House is of their own making. I am happy to give way. Uh, I am grateful to the Honourable Member for giving way, and he is absolutely right in this. The answer to this did lie in the timetable. The Government could have protected the time for that, that string of, of amendments, and they chose not to. Does he not agree to, with me, though, that especially when you consider the nature of the bill that we were considering, to suggest that this House should somehow have to choose between debating amendments from the other place and voting on yep, them yeah. is yeah. quite ridiculous. Yeah, 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 yeah. It is quite ridiculous, and I can't help but feel that the programme motion was put in place for that very purpose, because the government would have known that this House would have divided on the vast majority of those amendments, and therefore that three hours would, by nature, of the process of coming back from the House, the other place, with ping-pong, reduce that particular uh, time. And the reason I think everyone is so frustrated and angry about the process, and I will come on to why it affects the Seal Convention in a minute, is because the Secretary of State, who I won't get into the personal politics, the Secretary of State, I disagree with his politics fundamentally, but he's an honourable man, he's always dealt with me fairly, and in this process I think uh, he will look back and perhaps regret some of the actions that the government uh, have taken on this. But the Secretary of State promised at that dispatch box on a number of occasions that this elected House would get to debate the amendments on devolution that were being put to the other place. He promised it would come back at committee stage and did not. He promised it would come back at report stage and did not. And his own backbenchers, including the member for East Renfrewshire, who is in his place, said that he would reluctantly back the legislation and the amendments that were being put forward by the opposition. He would, he would back the government's position on the assurances he was given by his own front bench that those amendments would come back at report stage. The very fact these amendments have been placed in the other place and therefore the elected House have been unable to debate them and indeed have any kind of input into them means that we are left in a situation whereby we have a grievance to be able to exploit because we have not even debated on the floor of this chamber the fundamental issues around the Sewell Convention, the individual parts of the amendments, what the impact is on the Scottish Government, what the impact is on the Scottish Parliament, what the impact is on the UK Government, what the impact is on UK wide uh, frameworks that are being put in place as part of this particular process. I will give way to the Honourable Gentleman for Kamar and Loughton. Thank you, Mr. Governor, and I agree wholeheartedly with the comments made about the programme motion. When it comes to the vote itself, Last week, he tried to justify Labour's abstention as the fact that had, had we defeated the government on the amendment, it would have reverted the devolution clause back to an even less satisfactory position. Is it not the case? Had we defeated the government, we would have gone back to the Lords for further amendment, and we could have got the amendments that we were actually looking for. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Well, he, the, uh, he misinterprets the Labour Party position. In, in fact, misinformation, misinformation is indeed uh, the role of, of the SNP in this. I'm, I, I'm very clear on the position that we've got. I think the, uh, um, I think the amendment placed in the House of Lords gets us to about 80 per cent of where we would like to be. I think the old Clause 11, as everyone in this House, including the Secretary of State himself and indeed uh, the Minister who's taking this debate, said was deficient. There has been a process of negotiation, and I have seen a process of negotiation. You can't always get what you want. I would like to, for the government to have gone much further, but on the basis that it is 80 per cent, in my view, acceptable, it didn't seem right to vote for it and didn't seem right to vote against it. That's a principled position uh, to take. And what I would say to the honourable gentleman is this. What is completely and utterly fundamentally disingenuous is to claim that powers are being taken back from the Scottish Parliament. It is also equally fundamentally disingenuous to say that this is a powers bonanza. They are both positions that are wrong. The powers of the Scottish Parliament will not increase by one iota with regard to this process, and the number of powers that will be taken from the Scottish Parliament as part of this process is zero, because the Conservatives and the SNP have it in themselves to continue to fight with each other because it is politically expedient for them to do so. All of these kinds of arguments and the pragmatic approach to this are indeed lost. Well, I will give way to the Honourable Gentleman, my constituent's neighbour, if, if, if she wants to dispel the fact that the Scottish Parliament will receive no less in terms of powers and will have no powers taken from them as part of this process. 
honourable gentleman seriously disputing that as a result of the amendments passed last week, 24 powers will be taken back to this Parliament for up to seven years, and at any time during that seven years, the UK government can alter them as they see fit. Mm -hmm. Has he read the amendment and is he seriously disputing that? Which is, in terms of the uh, Honourable Lady's question, is the bit of the amendment from the House of Lords that we disputed. And in fact, if you look at our front bench amendment in this place, if you look at the front bench amendment in this place, if you look at the front, I don't understand why the behaviour of the Scottish National Party in this, when I'm actually on their side of the vast majority, this has to be so hostile. There is no respect in this chamber for people being able to make uh, the, the points they're making. I agree 80 per cent with the amendment that came back from the House of Lords. This is the bit that I don't agree with. And in fact, our shadow front bench, the shadow Secretary of State, put forward an amendment in lieu of the Lords' amendments that stated the very fact that this was where the contention lay in terms of the sunset clauses. I have the 24 areas of legislation in front of me, and I would like to say to the people of Scotland who are perhaps watching this debate that we do need UK-wide legislation the frameworks on some of this because it is important for Scotland and important for the UK government and the UK economy to be able to operate. For example, environmental quality and standards and chemicals. Nobody could possibly suggest that in a pragmatic world in which we live in that you don't need both governments to come together and put together a proper UK framework for that kind of issue. That's just one of the 24 of the 153 uh, issues that have come up in this particular uh, process. And devolution is a, I'm not going to give uh, way again to Honourable Lady because other people uh, want to speak. She will get her opportunity uh, to speak in this particular debate. I think we have to take the politics and the heat out of this. And I said to the Secretary of State, State last Thursday during the statement that is there any possibility of, of people continuing to talk on this matter? The Secretary of State says he is willing to talk, but the Scottish Government won't move from their position. The leader of the SNP said in my intervention to him a few moments ago that the Scottish Government, in his view, would be willing to talk. So when can we possibly get uh, both governments round the table to try and thrash some of this out? And one of the nubs of the problem of this issue is that the Joint Ministerial Council, the Joint Ministerial Committee, the JMC, don't, doesn't meet regularly enough, and in fact, as Lord McConnell said, who set up this particular process, it should have been scrapped a long time ago. During the passage of the Scotland Bill in 2015 in this chamber, and all the SNP members were here, you will remember the amendments that I put forward at that dispatch box to put the JMC on a statutory footing, to allow minutes and to allow agendas to be published publicly, so we didn't get into a situation where he said, she said, and it becomes a political uh, football. I would urge to the Minister now when he gets the dispatch box as part of this debate, that he gives a clear commitment that every single piece of communication that has happened in the JMC with regards to the devolution amendments is published. And I will tell you why he should do that. Because whilst this whole process is secret, and whilst people are kept in the dark about who said what and who agreed to what, all we get is this is a power grab, this is a power's bonanza, and the people of Scotland have to take sides on which one they feel is most appropriate. And we do know, and I do know, that because the compromise was, was made, I'll, I'll give you it shortly, because the compromise was made, I want to know, and the people of Scotland want to know, how far apart are the two sides? Is it the case that it's two minor things that the Scottish Government are deliberately withholding consent because it is not in their interest to give consent. And I agree with the Honourable Gentleman uh, for uh, Dumfries and Galloway that I do not think the Scottish Government ever intended in giving consent, even if they got 100 per cent of what they wanted. It is not in their political interest to do so. So let us have a little bit uh, of transparency about this process so we can see in black and white where the gap is and how we are able to bridge that gap. I will give way to the Honourable Gentleman. Mr. Speaker, further to my earlier intervention to the Right Honourable Member for Sky, Lough Haber, and, Sky, and Ross, can I ask uh, the Honourable Member whether he agrees with my suggestion that many of us will not be on J joint ministerial committees, but some sort of backbench liaison, cross party, and between MPs and MSPs like would be constructive for the future operation of both parties? I think it would, and I think if this process has shown anything, that the intergovernmental uh, relationships between two governments when they are of different colours does not work. And it does not work. And the consequences of it not working is not that the Secretary of State can't get what he wants or the First Minister can't get what she wants. The consequences is it's bad for the people of Scotland. 
because we cannot get to a situation whereby we have an orderly withdrawal from the EU if, that was, if that was, that's what happens, and let's not get into the issues around whether or not we'll leave the EU, etc. etc. I have my own views. But if we are to leave, then we need a proper structure in place where both governments can be confident and the people of Scotland can be confident that both governments can work together. It is in both governments' interests, I'll say, Honourable Gentlemen, to fight over these particular issues because they cannot resolve some of the major problems with regards to leaving the European Union and therefore having a fight between flags between the Conservatives and the Scottish National Party suits both political agendas down to the ground, while every other issue that is on there ends up being on the agenda. I won't give way because we will run out of time, and I would hate for the Honourable Gentleman to walk out if he is not able to get his say in this particular debate. Mr Speaker, I will make two other brief points, if I can. I think we are all in the same place in this chamber in the terms of what we want to try and achieve. We want to be able to, if we leave the European Union, have a legislative uh, framework in front of us that works for the things that we need it to work for. It is quite clear from the people that speak to me that you can't have different frameworks with regards to animal movements across the UK because you need the UK internal market to work. You can't have different food labelling or you'll have a situation like I have in my constituency where we have a wonderful Mexican deli who imports all this stuff from Mexico but has therefore then got to relabel it all with all the different labels. You couldn't possibly have that uh, situation. So you do have to have some UK-wide frameworks that work and operate for the UK internal market. Now, it's not in the SNP's interest to make that work because they want out of the UK internal market. And that's partly the problem we have here uh, with the politics of this. So it comes down to the nub of the issue. And the nub of the issue is, is the UK government right in this particular issue? I don't think they are. They could have gone much further, and they've made a hash of it, and they're architects of their own misfortune with regards to this. But are the SNP Scottish Government willing to move to be able to get an agreement on this? And I think the answer to that is no. So in the absence of two parties who are unwilling to talk to each other or unwilling to compromise, where does that leave you in terms of the overall uh, devolution uh, settlement? So I will uh, finish uh, on, on this. Um, Lord Sewell, when he set up the Sewell Convention, said quite clearly that it should not be used for major policy issues that have a major political disagreement, and we are seeing that play out now. I do not know how we can get to a place whereby the Scottish Government can give this a legislative consent motion. I would suspect if Clause 15, Schedule 3 was deleted from the amended bill, it would still not give a legislative consent motion because it is not in their interest to do so. So, in the absence of two governments willing to, unwilling to work together, how do we get to a position whereby this bill can be passed and the Scottish Government can therefore say that it will uh, give it legislative consent? This is no power grab. This is no power grab and this is no powers bonanza, and both governments should tone down the rhetoric, get back round the table and think seriously about making sure the GMC operates properly in the future and be transparent about its minutes and agendas. Thank you. Order. With immediate effect, a five-minute limit on backbench speeches now applies because I am keen to accommodate the maximum number of colleagues. Mr Colin Clark. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And it is an honour to follow the Honourable Member for Edinburgh South, who spoke so many things which I agreed with and so many things which made great sense. <laughs> Mr Speaker, we are here discussing the Seoul Convention because of Brexit and because of the SNP aim of separation. In 2016, the EU referendum was not a Scottish vote, no more than it was a Yorkshire vote or a London vote. It was a UK vote. To respect the UK result, we must deliver the will of the people. The 2014 independence referendum makes Scotland democratically, beyond doubt, a vital part of the UK. We hear cries of Scotland's watching. Yes, they are. They are watching the SNP not respecting the independence referendum. They are watching not respect the fact they lost 21 seats in the 2017 yeah, general election yeah, yeah. against the Conservative and Labour Party, who both were running on Brexit manifestos. The SNP are ignoring the democratic will of the Scottish people. The Seoul Convention, as the Supreme Court made clear, is a political doctrine recognised by the Court. The SNP shout Scotland's voice was silenced. They claim amendments curtail the authority of the Scottish Government that the nature of devolution has been changed forever after months of ministerial negotiation. 
painstaking discussions by civil servants. The claim of power grab is simply a grievance. Which powers are Holyrood losing? Which powers will Holyrood not implement? 24 powers previously governed by the EU will be reserved temporarily to address trade issues, to open borders. Common frameworks are essential to business and jobs in our constituency, as an honourable friend from uh, East Renfrewshire said. 80 powers are immediately handed over. So where is the power grab? On these benches, we wanted amendments made in this House. That that we didn't is regrettable, and the, the Lords moved a long way. Did the Secretary of State and Cabinet Office, in good faith, work with the Scottish Government? Yes, Yes, they did in good faith. The SNP are acting as a fifth column. Industry can now see Holyrood cannot be trusted to represent them. Jobs will be undermined. In my constituency, in Aberdeenshire, the most prosperous part of Scotland, the the most effective part of the economy of Scotland, they are asking, why are we still squabbling over this and why isn't it being implemented? The EU referendum was about the UK, which Scotland chose to conclusively be part of in the 2014 referendum. Now, Nicola Sturgeon has seen the EU withdrawal bill as a saviour to precipitate independence reference to. It's the last chance saloon. The SNP have planned all along to try and wreck the bill. If fundamentally you believe the UK should remain borderless, retaining some powers in Westminster was a sensible stopgap. How else could we negotiate an all-UK trade area? Mike Russell thought he had a deal. The SNP MPs thought they had a deal. And frameworks are a no-brainer. Unfortunately, the Liberal Democrats and Labour have just realised this is simply a false flag. It's always been and always will be a bit independent ref to in Scotland. Jim Sillers, as I said earlier, laid the blame at the feet of Nicola Sturgeon. But this, what happened the other week, it undermines the institutions of this democracy. It damages Scotland's position in the Brexit negotiations because Nicola Sturgeon is clearly not acting as an honest broker. I will give way. You just give me a... and, and, and I'm grateful to the member for giving way. The member talks about this democracy and he compares the EU with the UK, which I, I, I find peculiar. Can he tell me of any other EU member state that's a democracy where a, a party has lost an election 21 times in a row but finds itself in power? <laughs> I, I appreciate the intervention from uh, uh, the honourable member, but I would remind him. This is the United Kingdom. We had an independence referendum. You and I are part of the United Kingdom. I want to protect the union. You want separation from this union. Now, Jim Sillers also went on to say something else, which is interesting, because he is the SNP. I cannot remember one hostile speech that could be construed as an outright attempt to trash Scotland's constitutional position. Not one. So this is not an attack on devolution, and it is not a power graph. But what I really want to come on to is language such as Martini's strategy hit and run radicalises those supporters to ignite the democratic process. It undermines the rule of law. It weakens Hollywood's role. Frankly, as the honourable friend said earlier, it potentially endangers politicians. If it's on the point. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. The very point about undermining democracy. Uh, the point has been made many times in this House that the parties in the Scottish Parliament have voted time and time again to make sure that the, our powers were retained. Uh, four out of four the five parties supported that. They voted no to a power grab. What part of no don't you understand? <laughs> The independence <laughs> referendum. They clearly said no, no for a generation. Way. My predecessor, my predecessor <laughs> Alex Hammond, said once in a generation. Yeah. And here we are. So which part of no do we understand? I think clearly the problem lies on the other side. I will, I will make some progress because many more people want to speak. Now we are are we defending the integrity of the UK and protecting devolution settlement? Clearly, yes, we are, because the Scots want their two governments to work together. 
using guerrilla tactics to undermine this place. The democratic norms, the very basis of our liberal democracy, is deeply disappointing. And taking the advice of my predecessor in Gordon, Alex Salmond, it may rally the SNP hardcore, but it will alienate the law-abiding, tax-paying Scots who play by the rules. We are here as Democrats. We should not let our constituents down. Yeah. Brendan O'Hara. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, and I, and I rise as one of those law-abiding, tax-paying Scots that the honourable member opposite so clearly has such a disdain for. And regardless of what the honourable members opposite would have us believe. It is now clear to everyone that following last week's unprecedented power grab in the Scottish Parliament and its powers, the Conservative Party and this Government have finally abandoned any pretence of even having the remotest commitment to devolution. That a power grab of this scale can be enacted by one Parliament over another demonstrates once and for all that the Tories have the slightest interest in respecting the fundamental principles of devolution. The contemptuous way in which Scottish democracy was dismissed by this place last week with a 15-minute lecture from the Right Honourable Member from Aylesbury was simply further proof that Scotland has no future in this United Kingdom, and the sooner we are free from it, the better. The Tories' disgraceful disdain for the will of the Scottish people as expressed by the democratically elected members of the Scottish Parliament, shows the Tories in their true colours. Anti-democratic, narrow-minded, backward-looking and insular. People who, as devout British nationalists, let us never forget, were from the outset vehemently opposed to the creation of a Scottish Parliament. For a century or more, the official Conservative Party position was to oppose even the slightest devolution of political power from London to Scotland. And it's only when confronted with the inevitable and in the face of overwhelming public opinion that they publicly at least embrace the idea of a devolved parliament in Edinburgh. They may have changed their tune, Mr Speaker, but like the leopard, they have not changed their spots. So it should not come as a surprise to anyone. At the first opportunity, they are using Brexit as an excuse to roll back on the devolution settlement, a settlement they never believed in, to try and claw back to London as many of the powers and competencies of the Scottish Parliament as they possibly can. Last week, the Secretary of State made the excuse of these not being normal times, and how in these circumstances that somehow justified his carrying out this power grab. What he failed to mention, Mr Speaker, was of course that according to the UK Government's own lawyers, when they went to the Supreme Court recently, when they said, and I quote, whether circumstances are normal is a quintessential matter of political judgment for the Westminster Parliament. So there you have it. The UK Government will decide what is and isn't normal, and it's they and they alone who will decide what powers the Scottish Parliament has and what powers will be restricted for up to seven years without that Parliament's consent. And is there anyone so naive who really believes that, having grabbed those powers to themselves, that the UK Government will return them to Scotland after seven years? Not a chance. Mr Speaker, no one should be in any doubt what is at stake here. Because once the precedent is established that Westminster can overrule a majority vote in the Scottish Parliament whenever there is disagreement, a standard will have been set and the ground rules will have been established. And it's my genuine fear that if we allow this to happen, it will be used as the Tories by the Tories for a pretext of seizing powers again and again and again whenever it suits them. As my honourable, right honourable friend for Ross Skyler said, this isn't about the SNP versus the Tory government, because the Scottish Parliament, the SNP, the Labour Party, the Greens and the Liberal Democrats all recognised that what the Tories were planning was nothing less than a power grab, an outrageous attack on the democratically elected Parliament of Scotland. Mr Speaker, this, let me be clear, this is Scotland against the Tories. Let me repeat, this is Scotland against the Tories. And if it does nothing else, then it should send a message to Downing Street and Dover House that their Tory power grab on our Parliament will not be tolerated by the people of Scotland. Yeah. Mr Speaker, in conclusion, let no one in this be any, any doubt the people of Scotland are furious at yeah. what is taking place. 
We have heard much of how these 87 powers are to be returned directly to Holyrood and only 24 are to be appropriated by Westminster. To me, Mr Speaker, that is akin to a burglar having been caught breaking into your house, defending himself by saying, you should be grateful I only nicked your telly. It is an absolute nonsense of an argument. A power grab is a power grab is a power grab, whether it is 1, 24 or 111. The precedent will have been set and that is why it has to be opposed. The theft of just one of Scotland's powers is one too many. Ross Thompson. I'm glad to be so warmly welcomed. Uh, Mr Speaker, before I get into my speech, I just want to touch on one thing. The language in this debate around about Scotland versus the Tories, us being anti-Scottish, does not help to heal the divisions that we have in Scotland. It's because of this kind of rhetoric that my office really is targeted by vandals. And even a couple of weeks ago, someone who's not my constituent was arrested because they were intimidating my staff. I would really urge those on other benches opposite to mind their language. Mr Speaker, the fundamental argument of the SNP is based on an untruth that there is a power grab. So let us be absolutely clear that none of these powers are currently exercised by the Scottish Parliament nor the UK Parliament, they are exercised by the European Union when we ceded that sovereignty to them. The only reason that the Scottish Parliament will be receiving any additional powers is because we are leaving that European Union, and that is something which the SNP has vehemently opposed to the point where they are threatening another referendum in order to hold and send those powers back. Mr Speaker, the SNP do not want these powers. They do not want a single one of them, and they are doing everything imaginable to keep those powers in Brussels. So let's look at the reality of what we're actually dealing with, which is a massive SNP power giveaway to Brussels. Because the benches opposite argue that these new Brexit powers constitute a power grab. But when it comes to those benches, Mr Speaker, we know that they won't let facts get in the way of great political rhetoric or for Twitter. In fact, I was amazed that the member for Ross Sky and Logaber was able to tweet while speaking. That's a great gift, uh, one that I uh, wish I could also adopt. There is no power grab. There is no power grab, which is why the SNP cannot answer the simplest of questions, which is which power that the Scottish Parliament currently exercises will it have taken away? Mr Speaker, the answer is none. In fact, Mr Speaker, as Clause 15 of the Withdrawal Bill makes clear, these powers are returning from Brussels and will pass by default to Holyrood, as well as they will Cardiff Bay and Stormont. In a number of areas, with agreement of the Scottish Government, there may, and that is the operative word here, may temporarily be frozen existing frameworks as they are handed down from Brussels with both governments so they can work together on common wide frameworks to ensure, ensure a short term stability. Now, the UK Government agreed to the SNP Government's request for a sunset clause, meaning that any of those freezes will be strictly temporary and last for five years maximum before the area is devolved. This will not be a permanent part of the devolution settlement. So, to be crystal clear, Mr. Speaker, over 80 new powers will go immediately to Holyrood, while in 24 areas the UK government will maintain the existing EU arrangement protecting, protecting the integrity of the UK internal market. It is due to the UK government flipping around Clause 11 into Clause 15 and making significant concessions that the Labour Welsh Government were able to sign up to the deal offered as being fair, re respecting devolution and protecting the UK internal market. The deal was reasonable and met the SNP's own test. Now, we understand that Mike Russell was ready to sign up but was overruled by Nicola Sturgeon. And we understand that is because she wants to put the interests of the nationalists ahead of the interests of the nation. Now, the SNP have seized on the failure to reach agreement and have called on the Secretary of State to resign in what is one of the most incredibly personal speeches I have ever heard. But, Mr Speaker, this is not new because on the 20th of May, the SNP press release went out saying Mundell must go. On the 21st of May, it said Mundell must go. On the 6th of June, it said Mundell must step aside. On the 13th of June, it said time for Sean Bowlett Mundell to go. On the 14th of June, it said Mundell must go. 
Mr Speaker, this is an SNP broken record. It is a childish contribution. And there are two governments, two people worked on this. And in fact, the person who refused agreement, couldn't reach agreement, is Mike Russell. Perhaps he should consider his position. And Mr Speaker, to uh, finish up, given I've got only 20 seconds left, the people of Scotland are watching and they see through the SNP stunts and they simply see them as standing in the way of the national interest as part of their desire and reason for a second independence referendum. Mr Alistair Carmichael. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I'm grateful to you for the opportunity to contribute to this debate and indeed for allowing this debate to happen at all. There are a number of issues of some significance uh, relating to our constitution which stand to be examined here. Regrettably, we have managed to avoid most of them thus far (laughs) in the course of the debate, but I hope you will allow me a few minutes just to touch on them, because, in fact, this is not just a debate about the constitution in the abstract. I represent two island communities which are overwhelmingly dependent on fishing and farming and crofting for their economy. And these are communities which will absolutely need to know what the future holds Mm post-Brexit. And they will need to know what is going to come in place of the common agricultural policy for agricultural support in particular. And when I met the NFUS representatives in Orkney on, on Friday, these were the questions that they were asking me. And time after time after time, I had to say, I'm sorry, I do not know because nobody knows. So this is not just about the Constitution. This is about something that is going to have a very serious and profound livelihood on my constituents. I want to say just a word or two about how we got here. The government has mishandled this whole aspect of Brexit just about as badly as it is possible to imagine. Certainly they have managed it as badly as they have managed the whole of the Brexit process. As others have said, amendments were promised at the dispatch box. We were told that this House would have the opportunity to debate them. These amendments did not appear. We were then told that they would come in the House of Lords, and indeed they did eventually come at a late stage in the House of Lords. In the meantime, the Scottish Parliament, for a variety of different reasons, there was no single reason why the different parties within the Scottish Parliament voted in the way that they did, but notwithstanding that, they all decided that they would withhold the legislative consent when the question was put to them. So the timetable that we were given last week should have been one that protected the time available to debate these amendments from the other place. It did not, and that was not an accident. The Government used the procedures of this House to avoid a debate rather than to engage in it. For that they are culpable, and for that we are all now having to deal. Mr Speaker, the the consideration of Lord's Amendment should also not have been something which was presented to us as an either-or for voting on them. This is, one of the, this is, I believe, the most significant piece of constitutional legislation we will debate in my lifetime, and we should not, when it comes to voting on Lord's amendments to it at this stage, be given a choice of either voting or debating. Now, the context for this debate is that there has been this abject failure of the Scottish and the United Kingdom governments to reach agreement. It is apparent to all who look on from the outside that there has been a lack of good faith in the negotiations between our two governments. And let me say quite candidly, it is apparent to me that if it is left to the Scottish Government and the United Kingdom Government, then they will never reach agreement because they have no interest in reaching (coughs) agreement. They are both approaching the Brexit issue through the prism of their own party interest rather than the national interest. I give way to my hon. Friend. I thank my hon. Friend for, for giving way and ask him if he shares my frustration in this impasse that they have reached, that it is the two parties who initially and for a considerable period of time did not back devolution who now claim to defend it since both the SNP and the Tories failed to come to the first stage of the debate. 
It's not as bad as the bedroom tax. Well, of course, we, we all know that the Conservatives opposed devolution, as indeed did the Scottish National Party. I remember the days of the campaign for Scottish Assembly. Yes, yes. I remember the days yes, of the Constitutional yes. Convention. I remember a whole series of SNP walkouts. Now, what we saw on Wednesday was just the latest in a long rhyme yes, of yes. these things. Remember, yes, so, yes. The, uh, for, when, it, when it mattered, the SNP were never to be found because they are not interested in devolution. Devolution is not what they want. But, Mr Speaker, I come back to this point of the frameworks that will be so necessary to my constituents post-Brexit. I don't know if anybody from the benches is wanting to intervene. No, but in which case I think normally we accept the courtesy. Right. I hear the right honourable members discussed the idea that somebody could walk out of the House of Commons and protest that a uh, decision he feels strongly about. Can he tell us how many times he's been part of walkouts of the House of Commons? I have indeed been part of the walkouts. Ah. Indeed, I'm grateful to the Honourable Member for the that minute one. because it won't take the full minute to explain it. <laughs> I have to say it wasn't perhaps the, the, the finest example of my <laughs> parliamentary career. And if the SNP had been wise, they would have learned from my mistakes. They will now need to have to learn from their own. Mr Speaker, the question of the frameworks is at the centre here. All the time that we have left, it is ticking down quickly. There is still no mechanism by which these frameworks are going to be agreed. My suspicion is that the Whitehall default is that they will have the final word. Clearly, that is not going to be good enough. And if, the pa- if our governments between them cannot decide on a mechanism, then my suggestion to the House tonight is that it is for us as parliamentarians to come up with that. I don't have all the answers to this, but we do already have mechanisms within our own standing orders whereby these things can be discussed. God forbid that I would ever want to go back to hosting the the Scottish Grand Committee again, but that is one forum in which we might uh, reasonably expect to debate these things on motions that are amendable and have as common position that, on which we could all ultimately agree. Mr Deputy Speaker, as I said earlier on in this debate, it is apparent that one of the weaknesses of our constitutional settlement is that we have no mechanism for Parliament to speak to Parliament. All the mechanisms are about government speaking to government. The other piece of, a make it up, the other piece of, of weakness that we have within our constitutional settlement is that there is no mechanism now for a, an honest broker in the middle of disputes between the governments. That is where we now need to focus our attention. We need to move away from this mix of black letter law and constitutional convention, and ultimately everything should be written down in a constitution. Thank you. Kirsten Hare. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Over recent months, we have heard increasingly bizarre claims from SNP politicians, both in this place and the Scottish Parliament. They have repeatedly said, without a single shred of evidence, not one example to back up their claims that a power grab is underway. Mr Speaker, that is simply fantasy. When questioned in the Scottish Parliament or asked for further detail in this place, no SNP representative can name a single power that is currently devolved that would be taken back to Westminster. And that is because, we, as we on these benches know and welcome, Holyrood is on the verge of receiving a vast array of powers that they would never have done had we remained in the EU. And although while welcoming this enhanced devolution, I do so with certain caution around how they will use these powers, not because of any objection around powers being devolved, but because when the SNP are set to receive more powers, there inevitably emerges a nervous press release from Butte House saying that actually it's quite complicated and could they have more time to decide on when to take these powers on. However, leaving Nicola Sturgeon's inability to grow the economy, take over welfare powers when they have been demanding them for years, deliver farmers' payments, boost education standards, roll out broadband beyond the central belt or ensure those living outside Side cities have access to health services. I have absolutely full confidence in their ability <laughs> to manage this massive influx of powers. To what we must never forget, one of the most powerful devolved parliaments yeah. in the world. Yeah. In fact, Mr. Speaker, 
I know why the SNP are reluctant to talk about specific powers in this context of the debate. Because they want nothing to do with these powers. Yeah, it's yeah. because they have zero interest in taking these powers on. In fact, I would go as far to say is the only thing that they want is for someone else to have these powers. They don't want these powers because all the SNP want to do is give every single one of them back to Brussels. Do they want to manage agriculture to diversify and grow our economy? No. Far better to leave the EU Commission to tell them how to do it. And are they interested in revitalising our coastal communities by leaving, in their idle Alex Salmon's words, the dead hand of the common fisheries policy? No. They would see our fishing industry tied to the disastrous CFP indefinitely, a stance that was reinforced by their MEPs only a couple of weeks ago. Will they ever take responsibility and get on with governing? No because they would rather campaign for an unwanted referendum rather than get on with the day job. Mr Speaker, I know full well the SNP are not interested in being constructive because at the end of the day they are not interested in governing. They have a simple, single objective, one that overshadows every policy, every press release, every negotiation, and that is to break up our union. The union which Scotland voted to, to re remain part of in 2014. Yeah. Scotland's opinions haven't changed. In fact, the last election allowed voters their chance to voice their concerns to the SNP that they were outraged at, with them riding roughshod over the referendum results, and half a million people voiced their concerns loudly and clearly. Yeah. Nicola Sturgeon's government. Nicola Sturgeon's government is not. Nicholas, Nicholas Sturgeon's government is not an honest broker looking to get the best outcome for Scotland. Her government is a wrecking ball designed to tear our nation apart. It's incredibly disappointing, but not at all surprising, to see the mentality in the members opposite who take their instructions from the party machine with no regard for representing their constituents. Because if they did, they would listen to their views and they would reach agreement. However, you can only reach agreement with those who have the desire to come to an agreement. Yeah. Patrick Brady. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to start on a slightly consensual note and join the tributes that have already been paid to the heroic work of the Scottish yes. Fire and Rescue Service and Police Scotland in responding to the tragedy at the Glasgow School of Art. Yeah. I want to send my sympathies, almost condolences, to Professor Tom Innes and the whole community. I had the privilege of seeing some of the restoration <laughs> work last year, and I share in the sense of devastation and hope that some legacy and restoration can be achieved. Yeah. I want to start on this issue of, of the nature of the power grab. There are two aspects to it. The first was explained by an honourable friend from Ross Guy on Lochaber. Schedule 5 of the Scotland Act is very clear. If it ain't reserved, it's devolved. And what is happening now is that powers that are not reserved to this Parliament are being stopped in their tracks from Brussels and being reserved to the House of Commons rather than being devolved to the Scottish Parliament. That is the fundamental first aspect of the power grab of the 24 powers that have been spoken about so many times. But the second and more important aspect, from my point of view, of the power grab is the contempt with which the yeah. refusal to withhold uh, the refusal to grant a legislative consent motion is being treated. The decision of the House of Commons last Tuesday to vote through amendments to the uh, European Withdrawal Bill that the Scottish Parliament had expressly refused its consent to is a fundamental change to the nature of the devolution settlement. It is fundamentally undermining 20 years of devolution. That is the real power grab. This Parliament yep. expressing its yep. sovereignty in the face of the sovereignty of the people of oh, yes, Scotland take it, take expressed it. in their legitimately elected Parliament. Yeah. Yeah. I, thank, I thank the Honourable yeah. Gentleman for giving way. He was making the point about these powers being reserved as a fundamental challenge to devolution. Could he tell me how does agriculture, fertiliser regulations, pose a fundamental challenge to devolution? How does elements of reciprocal health care propose a fundamental challenge to devolution? Mr Speaker, these are the 24 powers that are being reserved. They're not a chance to evolution, they're just common sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr okay. Speaker, he has, a, he has a far more rural constituency than I do, and perhaps the farmers in his constituency are so Perhaps they are happy with the idea that this Parliament will simply legislate and ride roughshod on those issues without the elected members of the yeah. Scottish Parliament. Yeah. But I'm not sure that the farmers
farmers that I do have in Glasgow North would share that view. The saddest thing about all of this, though, is that it didn't really have to come to any of this, but it simply hasn't been on the government's radar. And whether that's because it's a failure by the Secretary of State for Scotland to make Scotland's voice heard in Cabinet, or whether it's because Scotland is simply not important to the Tories, it doesn't yeah. really matter. But the reality is, on Tuesday and Wednesday of last week, we saw government whips eh, running around the benches negotiating with their, be- with their rebels. We saw government ministers from the dispatch box yep. negotiating yep. amendments in real time, Mr Speaker, to the bill that was being debated in this House. Yep. And yet, months of meetings in the Joint Ministerial Committee, months of messages and statements and questions and debates and so on, led by members from all the different parties in Scotland in this House, seem to have had absolutely, absolutely. no effect on yeah. the Scottish yeah. on the, on the, on the UK yeah. government. And that is the demonstration of the contempt, and that is the demonstration of the power grab riding roughshod over the views of Scotland expressed in the Scottish Parliament. And ironically, there are still ways, and I've raised this, there are still ways out for the government here, but it has so far refused to take them. On Thursday, I raised the issue of royal assent. It is up to the government when the final bill, the EU withdrawal bill, is put forward for royal assent. The minister can stand up here now and commit that it will not do so until agreement has been reached with the Scottish Government, because otherwise presenting a bill for royal assent while consent has been withheld is in blatant breach of the Sewell Convention. The Sewell Convention that was put on a statutory basis in the Scotland Act after 2015, all the greatest, we most devolved parliament in the entire history of the known universe, being snapped out and (laughs) snuffed out just like that by this House of Commons after a paltry 19 minutes debate. One minute of debate for every year of devolution. And let me say this about devolution in the Scottish National Party, and I say it with the greatest respect to the member uh, for Orkney. When I was 17 years old in 1997, I was out in the streets of Inverness knocking doors for the Yes Yes campaign. I don't remember that many Liberal Democrat activists joining us, and that was a Liberal Democrat seat at the time. The reality is that the Scottish National Party helped a lot on a cross-party basis to deliver devolution and has consistently delivered success in devolution, and the only people isolated throughout that period of time have been the Scottish Conservatives. I'll be happy to give Can the Honourable Member remind us of the role in the Constitutional Convention building the blueprint that created the Scottish Parliament from the SNP? Of course, in the, in, the early days, in the early days, the Scottish National Party it had an interest in the process of the Constitutional Convention, but the Constitutional Convention decided that it wouldn't consider independence. But the founding document of the Constitutional Convention, and I'm very happy to discuss this, the founding, and, and this is of fundamental importance to the Conservatives, and I defy any of the Scottish Conservatives to get up now and say that they will endorse the claim of right for Scotland, which was one of the founding documents. Because the claim of right for Scotland says that it is the fundamental sovereignty of the people of Scotland to determine their own constitutional yes. future. And the only party which has never signed the Constitutional ah, which has never signed the claim of right for Scotland, Union, which refused like to sign it in 1989, like it and which refused to endorse it when it was put to the Scottish Parliament in 2012, is the Scottish Conservatives. And if one of the Scottish Conservatives wants to get up now and say that they endorse the claim of right for Scotland, I will be very glad to do And a silence fell upon the Assembly. And of course, the great irony in all of this, and this is, this is a question I think the Minister for the Cabinet Office has to answer, the great irony in all of this is the know. fundamental damage that is actually being done to the UK Constitution as a whole. Now, we have the farce of the English Votes for English uh, Laws procedure in the House of yeah, Commons yeah, on a regular yeah. basis here, when the, the English UK's. Grand Committee, the English Parliament, is asked to grant a legislative consent motion to whatever it's already debated and already consented to. What is the point of that evil procedure now? If legislative consent uh-huh. motions from the Scottish Parliament and potentially the Welsh Assembly yeah. and indeed Northern Ireland um, are not even going to be paid attention to. The reality is uh, that the government has failed to, rep- to, to completely failed to respect the outcomes of both the independence and the Brexit referendums. It has re- refused to respect the differential result in Scotland and Northern Ireland and London and Gibraltar. This goes beyond a simple question of the Sewell Convention as it applies to Scotland. It is about how it applies across the whole of the United Kingdom. And the government is so determined simply to cling on to office yeah. that it does not seem interested in the consequences of the decisions that it is making and the constitutional havoc that is wreaking. Yeah. So whether it is by accident or design, things have changed. The 20th anniversary of the Scotland Act heralds a new era of devolution, and it is not the era that was promised uh, by the No campaign yep. in 2014. I am very fond of Alistair Gray's saying that we should work as if we live in the early days of a better nation. And there's another saying that the darkest hour comes just before the dawn. Well, this is a very dark hour 
for devolution. But perhaps that means that the new dawn of an independent Scotland, where our full powers are in our own control, are on their way. And those really will be the early days of a better nation. Yes, Ross. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. All this crowd are interested in doing is performing stunts and disrespecting Parliament. Not my words, but the words of the SNP's Deputy First Minister in Scotland, John Swinney, when an opposition party in Holyrood performed the same theatrics that we saw from the SNP last week. So their own Deputy First Minister thinks they should be in Parliament, standing up for their constituents and listening to the debate rather than walking out. So I agree with John Swinney and I hope, in the cold light of day, the SNP members will reflect on what they did last week and also agree with their Deputy First Minister. I also want to come to some of the points I put to the Right Honourable Gentleman for Ross Skye and Loch Haber. Because in my intervention, I asked two specific points, neither of which were answered. I asked, first of all, how many powers does the Scottish Parliament currently have, and how many powers will it have after the implementation of the legislation in this Parliament? Because if it is to be a power grab, there must be less. So I am giving an open invitation to all the SNP MPs here just now to stand up and intervene on me and tell me how many powers does the Scottish Parliament currently have and how many will it have at the end of this legislation going through Westminster? How many fewer will it be? Come on. Come on. Nobody. Nobody, Mr Speaker, because they can't. They cannot defend their claim of a power grab because it does not exist. Their leader couldn't answer it in my intervention, and now their entire parliamentary party cannot intervene to tell me because it does not happen. It is not happening. You are not losing any powers. You are gaining powers as a result of this government. Now, Mr Speaker, the second question I put to the Right Honourable Member for Ross Sky and Lochaber was what was his party's position in the 1997 general election? Because he stood up and said that the Conservatives opposed devolution in 1997. Well, the SNP opposed devolution in 1997 in the general election because in their manifesto, which I've read because the Honourable Lady for Central Ayrshire was so perplexed at my point, the manifesto for the 1997 general election from the SNP said the SNP are proposing a fully costed manifesto for an independent Scotland. Devolution was never mentioned. 37 pages never once mentioned. And do you know why? Because it's all about separation for the SNP. Every year, every month, every day, every hour, it's about separation for the SNP. They opposed devolution in the 1997 general election and they are working against it now because it is not in their interest of separation. Now, I will give way to get an extremely grateful to the uh, Honourable Gentleman for giving way because many of his colleagues have made reference to the uh, deal struck by the government of my country with uh, the UK government. But uh, during a session of the External Affairs Committee in the National Assembly, a Professor Tim Lang was asked what does he think the consequences would be for Welsh agricultural interests, and he said Welsh interests would now be steam rollerable following their capitulation. Is that what he wants for Scotland? Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I am grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for that intervention, because I am about to speak uh, about Wales and other people, because the Right Honourable Gentleman was saying that the people of Scotland are watching, and the people of Scotland are watching, and do you know what they are seeing? They can see the grievance politics of the SNP. Yes. They will come to their own conclusions about why the SNP Scottish Government ignores the Scottish Parliament's presiding officer, who said their own continuity bill was out with the remit of the Scottish Parliament. Yeah. The Scottish public yeah. will have to wonder why the SNP do not accept the concessions from this UK Government, which met with the approval of the Welsh Assembly and Welsh Labour. A government which the SNP told us they were hand in glove with in these negotiations, but all of a sudden, with negotiations from this UK government and concessions from the UK government, we got agreement in Unionist Wales, but not in Separatist Scotland. The people of Scotland also have to ask, why are Labour and Liberal Democrat peers wrong when they say that the devolution settlement will be respected in this? Many of those peers are architects of devolution itself, yet they can agree with what the UK government is putting forward. And the public in Scotland will have to ask why the SNP think Lord Sewell is wrong. 
The man who gave his name to the convention we are discussing today says he backs the UK government position. Lord Sewell said today he backs what this UK government are doing, respecting the devolution settlement of our country. So yes, Mr Speaker, the people of Scotland are watching. And what they see is the SNP working in the nationalist interest rather than in the national interest. Well, I want more for Scotland. I want Scotland to get more powers from this United Kingdom, which, United Kingdom government, which is what is happening. But people will ask, have to ask, why do the SNP not want these powers? Why do the SNP want to give these powers straight back to Europe? As my honourable friend Fer Angus said, for fishing in my Murray constituency, hugely important, yet the SNP do not want the powers coming from Westminster to Holyrood. They want them to go back to Europe. Well, I would say in a final message to the SNP members here today, if you do not want these powers, Scottish Conservatives do. And at the next election in Scotland, Ruth Davidson will use these powers as First Minister of Scotland because the public can see the people who do not want these powers, who can't use these powers, need to be replaced, and the Scottish Conservatives are ready to do that. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Gavin Newlands. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Speaker. Um, I've got news from the SNP does support independence. Yes. <laughs> when, the, when, the story, when the story of independence is told, as surely it will be, um, there will be some key events which will be highlighted as critically important. The election of Winnie Ewing to this place in 1967, yeah, 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 yeah. Margaret Thatcher's tenure as Prime Minister and her imposition of the poll tax, yeah. the fall of New Labour and the illegal invasion of Iraq. Mm -hmm. The occasion of the Scottish Parliament and subsequent election of Alex Salmond as First Minister and, and there was an SNP government, um, and in fact for every election ever since 2007, truth be told. But I suspect that last Tuesday's disgraceful events, when the devolution settlement was ripped up in 15 minutes with no Scottish speaker, will in due course perhaps go down as perhaps the key moment when Scotland's fate as an independent country was sealed. Since the 2015 election, the SNP group has worked hard to represent our constituents and hold this government to account. As the Parliament's third party, we have, in large part, played the Westminster system, and while the Labour Party have been in disarray, we have acted as the main opposition. We have remained consistent and principled on so many issues, like Brexit. The Westminster system does not come naturally to the SNP. I am sure that viewers watching in Scotland, where we have a modern, efficient Scottish Parliament, with such witchcraft and wizardry, like electronic voting, uh, will also find the archaic system here strange and unusual. We have tried, tried our best to highlight these strange procedures, but worked with them as best we can, so we can stand up for our constituents and stand up for Scotland. But Mr Speaker, last week's events said it all. No matter how hard Scottish MPs of, of any party um, work in this place, no matter how much patience, patience we show, the Seal Convention and, moreover, the uh, Westminster itself does not work for Scotland. As we have heard already, the Tories are no friends of the Scottish Parliament. They campaigned against its very creation. And their Brexit programme shows that they want powers that should rightly be transferred directly to Edinburgh, as per the Scotland Act, kept in this place, the Palace of Westminster. But Mr Speaker, this issue now extends beyond Brexit. It is not about whether you voted for Brexit or voted to remain. This is about we whether Westminster can actually serve Scotland. The Tories' behaviour over the past week has brought people of all political persuasions and none together in believing that Scotland's time at Westminster may be coming to an end. Yeah. Murray Foote, the former editor of the Daily Record and yeah. architect of the Row, yeah. is one of those yeah. who now support yeah. independence, calling Westminster's behaviour yeah. last week a democratic <laughs> abomination. I'm, I'm not entirely sure what's funny, if I remember Sterling, the, the former editor of the Daily Record, who campaigned against independence, now supports independence. Yeah. Yeah. We have heard, uh, we've heard and perhaps the honourable member, member should perhaps listen, but we've, so we've, we've heard about the surge of people who have joined uh, the SNP following last week. This past weekend I was at street stalls in Renfrew and in Erskine and spoke to some of the new local members who have, who have joined in the last few days. Many, many of our new members have, have long been sympathetic uh, to independence. Some have historically been uncertain. Some even voted no in 2014. But Westminster's behaviour in the last week has pushed them to join yeah. the SNP, yeah, yeah, yeah. and the government should really listen to the message that they are sending them in doing so. The people of Scotland are coming to the conclusion that Westminster does not represent the interests of Scotland. 
The Tories hoped that no one in Scotland would notice or care about Westminster's power grab um, and the lack of time that was afforded to the debate itself. How wrong they were. But I actually disagree with my honourable friend from McGill and Butte uh, when he said it was Scotland versus the Tories. It's actually the Tories versus Scotland. Yeah. But let me assure the people of Scotland and the people of my constituency in Pearsley Remshire North that the SNP will continue to stand up for them and their parliament. We will com campaign to bring forward emergency legislation to end the power grab to protect the powers of the Scottish Parliament and ensure that Brexit does not harm jobs and living standards in Scotland. I lay that same challenge to the Scottish Tories. Will you stand up for Scotland? Yep. Or will you continue to treat voters in Scotland with utter contempt? Yeah. Yeah. Luke Graham. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I think this issue is a relatively simple one. The EU referendum was a UK wide vote, and over a million people in Scotland voted to leave the EU. In 2014, there was a referendum that decided Scotland should remain part of the UK, and the separatist argument lost by 10 percentage points in that referendum, a significantly greater margin than the EU referendum whose business currently preoccupies this House. Respecting the will of the people in Scotland, which is constantly brought up by members opposite, is exactly what this side of the House is doing. Yeah, yeah. People in Scotland voted to remain Scottish and British, to have a devolved parliament in Edinburgh, but also have their parliament here in Westminster. It was a constitutional decision that reinforces our current structure of government and made sure that we still keep this parliament of Scotland England, Wales and Northern Ireland, here in Westminster and here Sovereign, where it has directly elected representatives. Mr Speaker, Section 2 of the Scotland Act 2016, which was shaped by a cross-party Smith Commission, is unambiguous in inserting the UK's Parliament power to make laws for Scotland and that devolution does not diminish that power. The Act also recognises the Sewell Convention, which states it is recognised that the Parliament of the United Kingdom will not norm normally legislate with regards to devolved matters without the consent of the Scottish Parliament. But these are on devolved matters, and clearly these are not normal times, as Mike Russell, MSP, recently acknowledged. The Convention also does not apply to resolve reserve matters, Mr Speaker, which Schedule 5, Part 1 of the Scotland Act defines, among others, the Constitution and Foreign Affairs as explicitly reserved powers for MPs in this House to discuss and decide. The European Union could not be legitimately defined as that which would be normally dealt with by the Scottish Parliament, and it is very, very clear that the powers are reserved and should be dealt with in this place. And it's for these reasons, Mr Speaker, I believe that the presiding officer of the Scottish Parliament deemed the SNP administration's con EU continuity bill, which, by the way, was rushed through on emergency le legislation with just 25 hours of debate, yeah. to be out with the competence of the Scottish Parliament. Indeed, far from protecting or even respecting the devolution settlement, Mr Speaker, the SNP is showing complete contempt for the devolution settlement yeah, and to our yeah. constituents with it. The EU withdrawal bill and this whole debate is, to, is concerned with powers that previously sat in Brussels and now sit in the United Kingdom. And I find it ironic that the SNP are fine having unelected Brussels bureaucrats set laws for Scotland, exactly. but find it an outrage when this Parliament, which is also Scotland's Parliament, with its own directly elected MPs, make laws. Mr Speaker, it cannot be a power grab if Holyrood never had those powers to begin with. Oh. And finally, today, Mr Speaker, Lord Sewell, who I imagine has some insight into these matters, stated clearly that Westminster needs the power to move ahead and that there is no constitutional crisis. So, Mr Speaker, to recap, that's the Scotland Act, the Smith Commission, the SNP MSP responsible for the Constitution, the former SNP Deputy Leader and Lord Sewell himself acknowledging the validity of the Sewell Convention and reinforcing the sovereignty of this House. And, Mr Speaker, I think we should take this moment to remember what devolution was truly meant to be about. It wasn't meant to be about erecting a wall between Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom. It was meant to bring power closer to communities throughout the United Kingdom. And, in fact, the Smith Commission went one further, Mr Speaker, and said that power should be coming from Holyrood to the individual local authorities. Has that happened in Scotland? No. There's been a clear centralisation of power in Edinburgh. Powers are being taken from Westminster and centralised within Edinburgh with no respect 
Mr. Speaker, this isn't good devolution, this isn't bad devolution, this is deliberately dysfunctional devolution, stoked by an SNP that are so obsessed by separation from the United Kingdom that it cannot countenance even making an agreement with them. And Mr. Speaker, as I outlined earlier, what's really clear is that this isn't about the 24 powers that we need a UK common framework with, because as I talked about, they're about fertiliser, it's about food labelling, it's about standards. When I was looking, there was no one in my constituency saying we want them so drastically different to the rest of the UK. It's an assault to devolution. That's what the 24 yeah, powers are yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, and if we want yeah. to get into the detail of it, Mr Speaker, that's what we should be engaging on. We've been threatened tonight. We've been threatened with disruption. We've been threatened by another referendum. We've been threatened for paying a price, as the yeah. Honourable Member opposite said. Rick well, you carry on with the threat threats. Yeah. We'll be focusing on delivering for our constituencies. <laughs> Mr Speaker, what we've seen in the last week is very, very simple. The mask has slipped. The facade has fallen down. And what is revealed is naked nationalism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And while they're yeah, fighting yeah. to separate the United Kingdom, we'll be fighting to unite it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Savile Roberts... And it's an honour to be the first to speak for Wales in this yeah, debate yeah, this yeah, evening. Yeah, and I welcome the Secretary of State back to his seat, from which he has been absent for much of this debate. Yeah. It's impossible <laughs> to overstate the seismic implications Brexit has for Wales. At the heart of this debate is how the British state will function post Brexit and what the British state considers to be normal. We can no longer assume that the rightful trajectory of power, namely closer to the people, will continue in the way it has done since 1997. What we are facing is a shock tactic, a vortex of centralisation, a self-affirmation of self-interest in serenity of and by and for Westminster. And what will this mean in practice? We've been talking about 24 powers, haven't we? Well, actually, there's been some mission creep on that in Wales. Yeah. Two more. 26. State aid and food geographical indications. Really? And this means something in practice in Wales. It will mean the denial of state aid for threatened industries like steel by a government which believes in an unfettered free market. It will mean an agricultural policy no longer designed to protect farming and the rural economy. And all that means for Wales, for Wales in terms of the environment and our language and our culture. It will mean slash and burn procurement policies hardwired to ignore social and community benefits of public expenditure. And it will mean enabling, once again, the selling off of Wales's fish stocks to the yeah. highest bidder, yeah. something yeah. our government should have been able to prevent and now will not be able to do so. Yeah. Developing common frameworks for the UK as a whole should require mature cooperation between the national governments of the UK and shouldn't be a case of one country at its dripping powers away from the others yeah. Yeah. in order to impose a one-size-fits-all England first framework yeah, exactly. yeah. across all of the yeah. UK's countries. <laughs> Yet at the very same time, Westminster will only be bound by promises, political promises, while the devolved governments face legal constraints. Yeah. Yeah. Westminster acting again as judge and jury. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, the disregard for Welsh democracy is endemic. Despite Labour's half-baked attempt at improving the power grab clause, the people of Wales would be forgiven for thinking the opposition and the Tory government were colluding to deny Wales its voice. To rub salt into an already aggravated wound, the Labour Party needlessly pressed ahead with 11 consecutive votes, some of which were duplicates, which they knew full well would lose, all of the while eating into time for the next debate, the devolution debate. Not only did the Labour Party facilitate the, the farce of a debate that took place last Tuesday, they abstained. Yes, with the exception of one honourable gentleman, which I would note is also the presence of the Labour Party of Labour MPs from Wales here this evening. Labour abstained on amendments that took powers away from our National Assembly for Wales. It speaks volumes for the lack of respect on the part of the British Government that they are ploughing ahead with this bill before the Supreme Court reaches yeah, yeah. a verdict on the Scottish Continuity Bill. And as we know, as part of the deal between the Unionist parties, the Labour Welsh Government agreed to withdraw the Welsh Continuity Bill and its referral to court. In what can only be described as a convoluted turn of events, 
I understand that the Labour Welsh Government has requested to re-participate yeah. in the Scottish Continuity well, Bill Supreme Court case, uh -huh. yeah. uh -huh. but this time your decision. in defence yeah. of the UK yeah. Government's yeah. position uh -huh. as uh -huh. obedient good unionists. Tag two. Uh -huh. Tag two. Yeah. 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 When my party argued in favour of Remain in 2016, we did so because we believed, and we believe, that small nations like Wales are better served sitting alongside the other successful small nations of Europe as equals. We argued that the inbuilt inequality of the UK would make Wales expendable political collateral to the overriding interests of England. And we were right. While Tory and Labour unionists, 40 MPs, remember, out of the 650, look at the maths for how the inequality is written into here. While Tory and Labour unionists work hand in glove, I am confident that Brexit will be a landmark in the journey Wales takes to our own conclusion, that only our own radical solutions will prove the answer to our needs. Westminster and its parties will always treat Wales like an adjunct, an afterthought, an inconvenience. All this does is make the case for Wales political Thank you. independence. Hear, hear, hear. Thank you very much. Andrew Bowie. Thank very much, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I am grateful for the chance to speak tonight because I too was frustrated by the Labour Party's uh, determination to silence the voice of Scotland last week by dividing 11 times on the EU withdrawal bill. So I am grateful for the opportunity to give up my evening to talk about important issues this evening. Section 28.7 of the Scotland Act reads as follows. This Act does not affect the power of the Parliament of the United Kingdom to make laws for Scotland. The following from the White Paper, Scotland's Parliament, published in July 1997. There may be instances, for example international obligations which touch on devolved as well as reserved matters, where it will be more convenient for legislation to be passed by the UK Parliament. The Scotland Act and the White Paper that preceded it are very clear. This sovereign Parliament of the United Kingdom can legally legislate for the entire United Kingdom. However, as is normally the case, we desire consent from the Scottish Parliament. And that is exactly what this Government have sought to achieve through months of dialogue and talks with the Administration in Edinburgh and, of course, in Cardiff, with regards to the European Union Withdrawal Bill. But as Mike Russell himself has said, these are not normal times. It is simply wrong to suggest, as the SNP have tonight and prior to this, that Her Majesty's Government are trying to ram through legislation that somehow threatens the devolution settlement. They have not, and it does not. In fact, one can only come to the conclusion as to why the Welsh Government appear content with the new Clause 15 and the Scottish Nationalists don't, is that the Scottish Parliament have never wanted to come to an agreement. The destruction of our United Kingdom is the raison d'etre of the SNP and nothing else, not the economy, not the internal market of the UK or the common frameworks for agriculture or fisheries, no, nothing matters but the break-up of our United Kingdom. Hence, hence their constitutional crisis manufactured Hence their temper tantrum last week during Prime Minister's questions when, in the world's words of a constituent of mine on Friday afternoon, Jan Loons fairly embarrassed themselves. Yeah. The SNP leadership claim the people of Scotland aren't being listened to. Well, like my honourable friend, the member for Paisley and Renfrewshire North, I spent the weekend. I, I, I regard him as a friend, actually, uh, I would say. Uh, like my honourable friend, the member, in Act 2. I don't, know how, I don't know how that will go down in Paisley, but I'll, let, I'll let, leave that to him. I was out this weekend talking to my constituents in Act 2, Socken, Money Musk, and Dramok, and I was listening to what the people there were saying. And I tell you what, if Brexit came up at all, and the Constitution came up at all, which I have to admit it rarely did, the people said that they were sick to death of the childish games being played by the Nationalists. What we should be doing, they, they told me, was respecting the result and working together to guarantee a, a fruitful future for our farmers, our fishermen, our businesses and our people. That should be what we are doing now, not fostering gripe and grievance, not manufacturing a constitutional crisis, for that is what they are doing. Even Lord Sewell, my constituent and the author of the Sewell Convention, agrees there is no crisis and the government is absolutely right to move ahead without consent due to Brexit being a major adjustment. This government has been open, honest and willing to make changes and in the new Clause 15 there has been. For the avoidance of doubt, although it does not being repeated again. Let us be absolutely clear. There is no power grab. Not one single power is being stripped from the Scottish Parliament. In fact, 18 new powers 
are returning from Brussels straight back to Holyrood, where the SNP would have them remain. And another 24, all of them agreed with the administration in Edinburgh, will be temporarily held at Westminster, subject to a sunset clause again, something that the Scottish Government asked for. Mr Speaker, this Conservative Government is legislating for the entire United Kingdom and all of its people. We have made concessions to the withdrawal bill to make it work and to be acceptable to the people of all of our country. We are the party committed to building a Britain fit for the future, making a success of Brexit, enhancing devolution. In fact, we are the only party of devolution, governing in the national interest, a one-nation party for one nation, every part of the UK. The Conservatives are getting on with governing, while the SNP are just getting on with governing. Joanna Cherry. Mr Speaker, um, I got the impression, Mr Speaker, over the weekend that the benches opposite and the Metropolitan Commentariat were rather surprised at the strength of feeling displayed by SNP MPs last week at the pitiful amount of time that was allowed for debate of these matters. But there should be in no doubt, Mr Speaker, that that is a strength of feeling that is felt across Scotland. Yeah, yeah. On the flight home and in my constituency at the weekend, I was inundated by members of the public congratulating us on taking the stance yeah, yeah, that we did. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, in Deuce, undemonstrative Edinburgh, I was unable to get my messages done in Marks and Spencers at Slateford for people coming up to me wanting to shake my hand and tooting their car horn, shouting out that we had done the right thing. So, lest it be thought that this is only about what us individual SNP MPs think, I want to devote what little time I have today to some of the views held by members of the Scottish Commentariat, Scottish Civic Society and a prominent Scottish constitutional lawyer. Mr Speaker, I think the position was very neatly summed up at the weekend by the distinguished journalist and commentator Kevin McKenna, who is not afraid to criticise my party when he does not agree with us, when he wrote in The Observer at the weekend, and I quote, the UK Government has sought to portray the SNP's anger over the power grab as illusory to the point of non-existent. The 24 powers will eventually make their way to Holyrood, so what is the problem, they ask. Mr McKenna goes on to say the problem is threefold. Firstly, it could take up to seven years for those powers to return, a period that would outlast a term of government on either side yep, of the border. Yep, yep. Secondly, at any time during that seven-year period, the UK Government could alter those powers as they see fit. Yep. Exactly. And thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, Mr Speaker, a precedent has been set allowing any UK Government to override the Sewell Convention by which Westminster won't legislate on devolved competencies without Holyrood's permission. Not my views, uh, the views of uh, Mr McKenna. Now, uh, Mr Speaker, um, the Sewell Convention provides that Westminster will not normally legislate in relation to a devolved matter without devolved consent. And I'm afraid to say an awful lot of nonsense has been talked about what the word normally means. Fortunately, uh, you don't have to take my word for it, Professor Aileen McHarg, Professor of Public Law at the University of Strathclyde, at the weekend very helpfully set out some of her views on what not normally means. She says not normally does not mean, goodness me, this situation is a bit unusual, so we can therefore ignore the usual constitution. <laughs> Not normally does not mean I say it's jolly difficult if we have to agree stuff with the Scots and the devolved institutions, so let's just ignore them. Nor does not normally mean so long as we make some kind of effort to reach agreement, even if it's a bit late and we have to be forced into it, it doesn't matter if we can't actually reach agreement. What not normally means is as follows. The Sewell Convention is a rule, not merely a description of practice. So the word normally has to be understood as an exception to the rule. In the principles of legal interpretation, we make exceptions to a rule either where the underlying rationale for the rule does not apply or where there is some overriding competing principle. The rationale for the Sewell Convention is protection of devolved autonomy. Now, Mr Speaker, it's not clear to me or Professor McCarg why the protection of devolution should be suspended by the Brexit vote, particularly when Scots didn't vote for Brexit by a majority of two to one. 
So what Professor McCard concludes is, on the basis of what few precedents there are, and the discussions at the time of the enactment of the Scotland Act, and in relation to the old Stormont Convention, devolved consent can only be overridden in cases of necessity or where the devolved legislature is abusing its power. There is no evidence that the devolved legislature is abusing its power, and in order to have frameworks, there is no necessity for those frameworks to be imposed from above. I will give you on that point. So, given that, what she has just informed the Chamber of, is it not the case that the Executive in London could be accused of abusing its power? Yeah. Indeed, it is the Executive in London that is abusing its power, and that is why the Sewell Convention is, in the words of the BBC fact check, ripped up and thrown away by last week's. Um, last week's uh, amendments. Now, just a, a word of warning from another commentator for the Tories opposite, uh, from Danny Gar Garavelli in The Guardian. She said, ordinary voters may not be greatly exercised about the finer points of the Constitution, but they can hear the mood music. They know when their Parliament is being slighted. Already frustrated over the democratic deficit that allows Scotland to be taken out of the EU when every part of Scotland voted Remain, Many of them will look askance at the dismissive way Conservative politicians behaved in the Chamber on Wednesday. Yeah, and in relation to displays of anger from myself and others last week, she says, those displays of anger will be echoed around much of the country. <laughs> Anyone who doesn't understand the potential impact of such condescension on the psyche of Scottish voters was not paying attention last time round. And I look forward, Mr Speaker, to putting pictures of their jeering faces on the leaflets in the next independence referendum. Yeah. Yeah. Home Master Turn. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Mr Speaker. Aviation. Compensating PSO air routes, carbon capture and storage, control of major accident hazards, electronic road toll systems, elements of EU social security coordination, marine environment issues, the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, the Environment Impact Assessment Directive, Environmental Law Concerning Energy Industries, Flood Risk Management, Water Quality, Water Resources, Domestic Forestry, Genetically Modified Microorganisms Contained Use, Heat Metering and Billing Information, Implementation of Cross-Border Healthcare Rights to Treatment and Reimbursement, Land Use, Maritime Public Service Contracts, Port Services, Onshore Hydrocarbons Licensing, Renewable Energy Directive, Road Infrastructure Safety Management, Charging of HGVs, Voting Rights and Candidacy Rules for EU Citizens in Local Government Elections, Blood Safety and Quality, Applicable Law and Contracts and Non-Contractual Obligations, Cross-Border Mediation, Jurisdiction and Recognition and Enforcement of Judgments in Civil and Commercial Matters, Enforcement of Judgments, Instruments in Family Law, Legal Aid in Cross-Border Cases, Service of documents and taking of evidence, uniform fast track procedures for certain civil and commercial claims, energy and efficiency use, elements of the regulation of tobacco and related products, air quality, biodiversity, marine environment, natural environment and biodiversity, spatial data infrastructure standards, waste management, equal treatment legislation, good laboratory practice, High efficiency cogeneration, late payment for commercial transactions, the list goes on and on and on. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, there is no power grab. The over 80 powers that the Scottish Parliament does not currently have and would not have if we were not leaving the European Union will be going to it on the day we leave the European Union. 24 other areas, each and every one agreed with the Scottish, Scottish Government, will remain temporarily with the UK under common frameworks. There is no power grab. What there is is an honouring of a commitment by this Conservative UK Government to respect and strengthen the devolution settlement and protect the integrity of our United Kingdom. Here. Order. The front bench speakers will now come in, and I know they're going to try to stick at ten minutes each, because I'm very keen to accommodate remaining speakers. But we'll see how things go. Leslie Laird. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First of all, I would just like to echo some of the sentiments expressed tonight in relation to the fire at the Glasgow Art School, and to also thank uh, my colleague, um, the Shadow Minister, for the efforts that he has undertaken to raise the profile of this, appearing tonight as he did on Canadian television. So it really is a global issue, and we can recognise that fact. 
Mr Speaker, let me begin by reminding the people in this chamber and the people that we represent that this debate is of the utmost importance. Let me also acknowledge that several Scottish MPs are unable to attend today as they are otherwise engaged on Scottish Affairs Select Committee. This debate, at its heart, concerns the future of Scottish devolution settlement and the future of the UK itself. Set against that context, Mr Speaker, it's unbelievable that the Government Minister responsible for this has chosen to absent himself from the debate. Mr Speaker, let us be clear, the position that we find ourselves in today sits squarely in the lap of the party opposite. This Tory shambles is epitomised by the Secretary of State for Scotland, the invisible man in the Cabinet, and now missing in action at the dispatch box today. Mr Speaker, this isn't about a personal attack, but it is an absolute critique of that performance. The Secretary of State has been AWOL on many fronts, not at the Brexit negotiating table, not able to keep his commitments to the House, and not able to deliver to the Scottish Parliament the commitments, and not able to deliver on the commitments that he made to his colleagues on Clause 11. This debate today and the Tory shambles was totally avoidable. Their approach is playing fast and loose with devolution and playing fast and loose with the future of the UK. For a party that claims to want to protect the Union of the United Kingdom, their current approach serves only one purpose, and that is to play into the hands of the SNP, who, let us all be clear, do not want to protect devolution and who never wanted it in the first place. Mr Speaker, in contrast, let me set out the grown-up approach taken by the Scottish Labour Party. As the party of devolution, we want to protect devolution and protect the future of the UK at the same time. That is why Labour in the Scottish Parliament voted, along with the SNP, the Liberal Democrats and the Greens, to withhold consent to the EU Withdrawal Bill, particularly due to the provisions contained in Clause 11 of the Bill. Surely, at that point, the Tory Government must have understood the depth of concern about the way they were proposing to utilise the new powers. But alas, Mr Speaker, they did not. Instead, they carried on regardless, ignoring the Scottish Parliament and playing right into the hands of the SNP. In acting in this way, it has become abundantly clear that the Tories are as much a threat to the UK as the Nationalists. Mr Speaker, let me just outline how and why the shambles came about. We are here because the Secretary of State for Scotland and his UK Government decided that when they drafted the EU Withdrawal Bill, that all powers coming back from the EU would come to Westminster and be devolved to the devolved administrations at a time of their choosing, something that is entirely incompatible with the devolution settlement, a fact that their own Scottish MPs acknowledged. The Secretary of State for Scotland then promised on four different occasions that he would fix this flawed clause, but he did not. Last Tuesday, he managed to do something that I don't think anyone in this House could have envisaged. Complicit in a situation where no Scottish MPs or the Secretary of State for Scotland were able to speak about devolution, truly taking this process to a new level of farce. And a number of honourable members have talked about that it was Labour who somehow disrupted uh, this debate, that Labour somehow stopped democracy happening. But it was the party opposite who set the timetable. In fact, they only wished to set it for one day, and only on our pressing did they set it for two. But that was still not enough to debate what are some of the biggest constitutional issues that this country is facing. Labour throughout this process has tried to play a constructive role. We have tabled amendments and made suggestions to both governments. These could have helped to break the deadlock, but instead what we have seen are two competing nationalisms entrenched and intent in cancelling each other out. Throughout this process, only Labour has genuinely sought an agreement that protects devolution and breaks the impasse. The Leader of Scottish Labour and I wrote to the First Secretary of State asking for cross-party talks. 
So far, he has refused. I will not give way. I think the opposition has had ample time to state their case. I have spoken to the Secretary of State for Scotland, urging him to facilitate these talks. So far, he has refused. On each occasion, the mantra has been, unless there is something new to discuss, we will not meet. But, Mr Speaker, if that is the Government's approach, then it is a defeatist one. That is why it is time to freshen up the bench, and as other members have indicated, it is time to take a fresh approach and bring some new thinking to the table, to bring subject matter experts on law and constitution to the table, to bring in people from industry and business who ultimately will have to make sense of it all. And as the Right Honourable Member for Orkney and Shetland pointed out, the NFU, along with others, are waiting to see what that will look like. The Government has clearly run out of ideas, but openness to new ideas is of course predicated on the fact that they have a genuine desire to resolve the issue. And so far, Mr Speaker, their reluctance to do so may suggest that they are indeed content with the way things are. Mr Speaker, once again, it will be Labour who will bring forward proposals to break the deadlock. I will again be writing to the First Secretary and also Mike Russell with a further proposal that, at the very least, should compel all parties and experts to get round the negotiating table and to find a way to resolve this issue. Because, Mr Speaker, while we may have the luxury of standing here debating the constitutional implications of the Sewell Convention, we must remember that behind all of this constitutional wrangle, people and businesses require certainty and require both of Scotland's governments to work constructively together to reach a solution. We understand the need to negotiate on the common UK frameworks, but what we do not understand is why the industries and sectors impacted have not been in actively involved in these negotiations. Mr Speaker, let us be in no doubt that we are in this mess because of the UK Government. No joint ministerial committee for eight months. Eight months of time wasted that could have been used to sort this out. It is also my understanding that there have been two JIMC meetings cancelled over recent weeks. It is abundantly clear that deeds are not matching words. When the Secretary of State for Scotland says Scotland is not a partner in the United Kingdom, it is part of the United Kingdom, it really tells you all you need to know. Since Brexit, it is clear. Since Brexit, it is clear that intergovernment and constitutional mechanisms in the UK are in inadequate, and the debate that we are having about the Sewell Convention actually only reaffirms that case. We have a situation where the Secretary of State for Scotland can't even be compelled to come to the dispatch box to answer for his decisions and his quite obvious feelings on this matter. We have a situation where the UK Government can ride roughshod over the wishes of the democratically elected Parliament in Scotland, and there is no recourse. That's why it's called democracy. That's why it's called devolution. People in Scotland will be looking on at this and wondering if the UK Government actually has any real intention of trying to fix it. That not getting a deal and causing a constitutional crisis is actually politically beneficial to those who are nationalists on both sides of the argument. Mr Speaker, constitutional debates only fuel the politics of grievance. They do not fuel economic stability, they do not fuel equality and they do not fuel social justice. They just divert us from addressing those real issues in our society. In closing, I will now ask the First Secretary to be bold and to demonstrate the courage this situation requires and commit to four simple things. Will he show political leadership by getting back to the negotiating table, convene a cross-party meeting which the Leader of the SNP has indicated that he would be willing to attend, and include legal and constitutional experts to resolve the issues on the devolution settlement and to use the new offer that I will send him to resolve this impasse. 
Section 22 of the EU Withdrawal Bill allows for consequential amendments to be made to the Bill where it is appropriate. Has he explored this avenue and will he be open to consequential amendments under this section? The Secretary of State for Scotland has so far refused to publish the minutes of all meetings of the Joint Ministerial Committee. Will he agree to do so now? And will he also set a date for a JIMC meeting before recess? And finally, if there is no agreement be between the UK and the Scottish governments, will he ask the Prime Minister to sack the Secretary of State for Scotland? Because, because by, virtue, by virtue of him standing here today, it's clear that he does not have the confidence in his colleague to deliver for the people of Scotland. Uh, Minister David Livington. Mr Speaker, can I, can I start on what I hope will be a, a, a note of consensus in expressing both on behalf of the Government and personally my deep sorrow at the appalling uh, news from the Glasgow School of Art uh, over the weekend and to reiterate uh, what my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Scotland, said at the weekend that the United Kingdom Government stands ready to help, uh, just as we did come forward with assistance after the last such tragedy a few years ago. Now, I will try, in, in, while trying to keep to time, uh, to respond to the various points that have been raised during the debate. And for that reason, Mr. Speaker, I, I give notice. I'm, I'm intending to be perhaps less generous than I would normally be in admitting interventions to try to allow other honourable members to take part after I have sat down. And I think it might help us to get a bit of perspective um, uh, on uh, the subject we're discussing today, actually to take note of what none other than Lord Sewell himself said today, that um, the convention named after him has been observed, that there has been no power grab and that there is no constitutional crisis. So the UK Government's objectives in the negotiations and the various debates on what is now Clause 15 of the Bill uh, has been consistent and clear. We have had two objectives. First, to provide greater reassurance to the devolved governments and parliamentarians on how returning EU powers will be managed where they intersect with devolved competencies. And second, to maximise legal certainty right across the United Kingdom, particularly for the sake of businesses which both in Scotland but also in Wales and in Northern Ireland and in England have been making it very clear that they want clarity and certainty about the regulatory framework within which they will have to operate in the United Kingdom after we leave the European Union. And if we look back at October 2017, a meeting of the Joint Ministerial Committee on European Negotiations, which included ministers from the Scottish and Welsh Governments, agreed quote, to work together to establish common approaches in some areas that are currently governed by EU law, but that are otherwise within areas of competence of the devolved administrations and legislatures. The same meeting uh, secured agreement on a set of criteria to establish the need for a UK-wide framework. Those criteria included to enable the functioning of the UK internal market, to ensure compliance with international obligations and to ensure that the UK can negotiate, enter into and implement new international trade agreements and treaties. And it was also agreed, and, and uh, to, to um, uh, just respond briefly to what the, the Honourable Member for Edinburgh South said, that these uh, communiqués from this meeting, like other communiqués from uh, the Joint Ministerial Committee was published and is on the uh, Government UK website to this day. That meeting also agreed that some, though not every, framework would need legislation. Now, of course, the original clause of the Bill, the then Clause 11 that we brought forward dealing with devolution, was strongly criticised in this House, in the Scottish Parliament, in the Welsh Assembly, and by the governments, uh, by both devolved governments. And in the months since, uh, the debates here, there have been frequent and detailed discussions at both ministerial and official level 
to try to meet those concerns. And we have, contrary to what the Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Glasgow North, asserted, we have responded to those criticisms. The first criticism, that it was wrong to require, as Clause 11 did, that all powers returning from Brussels should be held at Westminster until a decision to transfer them to devolved competence had been made. That was a point made by the Scottish Parliament's Finance and Constitutional Affairs Committee uh, and by the Right Honourable Gentleman Member for Roskai and Loch Harbour during the debate here on the 4th of December last year. So we reversed that approach, having listened to those criticisms. Now the Bill provides for every power to be transferred straight to devolved level unless a specific order is made to stay it at Westminster. The second criticism was that too many areas of policy were covered by the freezing power. There were intensive discussions between officials and experts of both the United Kingdom and devolved governments, and that has led to the list of now only 24 out of 153 areas of competence where a legislative framework might be required. But as my honourable friend, the member for East Renfrewshire, pointed out, the long list of competences of new powers going straight to the Scottish Parliament and the Welsh Assembly is extensive indeed. Third, there were calls for a sunset clause, again from the Scottish Parliament's Finance and Constitution Committee and from the honourable gentlemen, the members for Perth and North Perthshire and Edinburgh North and Leith. And so we've done that. The power to make a freezing regulation will lapse automatically two years after royal assent to the bill, and any regulation made under that power would have a maximum term, I stress maximum, of five years, and our intention is that they should not last as long as that. Fourth, the Scottish Parliament asked for the Government of Scotland Act and the Government of Wales Act to be protected as the Northern Ireland Act was from being modified under the deficiencies procedure in the Bill, and that, again, we have done. So what we've now got is a strictly time-limited power applying to only a small number of policy areas returning from EU level. And where a framework freezes current powers for a short time, the situation will be exactly the same as it is now. We're not seeking, contrary to some suggestions in this debate, a power to change current EU rules, but to continue them for a maximum of five years while we sit down together and try to agree yeah, yeah, a long-term yeah, yeah. yeah, UK yeah. framework. And I have to say to the Scottish National Party, since it is their declared objective to either stay in or rejoin the European Union, it is hard to see why they should object to the continuation of EU rules with which they are currently content. Now, in addition to far-reaching changes to the bill itself, Made in response to the Right Honourable Gentleman and others, we have given a binding political uh, commitment embodied in a formal intergovernmental agreement to continue to apply the Sewell Convention. That, again, was something which during the negotiations the Welsh and Scottish Governments specifically asked for and where we agreed to make the changes. So the IGA states the commitment of both UK and the Welsh Governments to proceed by agreement. It makes it clear that the Sewell Convention will be fully respected, and we have made it clear that despite the fact that the Scottish Government and Parliament have uh, rejected so far a legislative consent motion, that we will act in our future dealings uh, with the Scottish authorities in the same way as we propose to act in relation to Wales, by observing in full the political commitments into which we have entered under the intergovernmental agreement. And I regret very much that the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament did not agree to the package in the way the Welsh Government and the Welsh Assembly yeah, yeah, did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it was pretty fairly summed up by Mark Drakeford, the Minister for Wales who led the negotiations for the Welsh Government, when he said the amended bill and the intergovernmental agreement that goes with it does both things that we set out to do. It safeguards devolution and it safeguards the future of a successful United Kingdom. Yeah, yeah. Or as Lord Griffiths of Berry Port, the Labour Party's front bench spokesman in the other place, said, everything that could have been done in areas where we have no precedent to appeal to has been done. I just say in response to the right honourable member for Orkney and Shetland, in going forward, 
Um, work is already underway on the detailed frameworks. My officials, the territorial officers' officials, are working with uh, devolved government officials on that task. And of course, he's right, we will have to take account of the views of industry, of uh, the farmers, and of other interests. So, Mr. Speaker, I believe that we have a good, balanced compromise package available. And I think what the people in all parts of the UK now expect is that their different governments and different legislatures work together constructively to represent them. That's what people expect. That's what this government wants to deliver. Fewer than 24 minutes left. Ten speakers wanting to contribute. You can do the arithmetic for yourselves. Formal limit, three minutes. But if you speak for two and a bit, everybody should get in. Otherwise, people won't get in. Tommy Shepherd. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I think it's important in this debate that we distinguish between competences which are a list of nominal responsibilities, and power, which is the ability to exercise change in those particular areas. And I have no doubt in my mind that we are in the middle of a process that is seeing a major transfer of power from the devolved authorities in the United Kingdom to the centre. And I would caution my honourable friend from Edinburgh South to look at the detail of what is happening and not be seduced by those in the benches opposite who say there is nothing to see here, move on, keep calm. The truth is this is happening in two ways. The first is a convention that has existed for 20 years is being torn up. And, Mr Speaker, that is extremely important because the genesis of the Sewell Convention was to give assurance to those who wanted to believe that devolution actually meant something, that power would be exercised by the devolved authorities. It was there to say it wasn't a matter of the Scottish Parliament making a decision which could be overridden. And now if we set the precedent where this is reversed, it is a situation that it can be at any time in the future. The second way in which power is being transferred is through the talk of joint arrangements. I'm not against having joint arrangements. There are plenty of opportunities where we should be coordinating things. But the devil is in the detail, and the principles that the government are putting forward are not fit for purpose. Because let me illustrate with an example. Imagine you have a committee which is to discuss farming policy. On that committee, Scottish farmers will be represented by the Scottish Government, Welsh farmers by the Welsh Government. But who will will represent the interests of English farmers? It will be the United Kingdom Department. (laughs) Now, I think English farmers should have a say, Mm -hmm. but I don't think it's fair that the body that advocates for them should also sit as judge and jury if there is a difference of opinion in that committee. And that is what is being proposed, and that means that every time there is a difference of opinion, the small the smaller party will lose out to the larger one. So if the Scottish Government wants to take a policy on GM crops, it could be overridden. If it wants to take a policy on waking subsidies for cold climate, it could be overridden. And on and on there is the opportunity to do that. That is what we mean by a paragraph. I believe in devolution. I tell the Honourable Member from Orkney, I was a member of the Scottish Constitutional Convention. The Honourable Friend rightly says that he believes in devolution. Isn't it the case that the actions of the UK Government at the moment are just a long line of a pattern where the UK Government, where the the Conservatives have been against everything? The the Honourable Gentleman, he's voted against every opportunity. Well, I do do think that is absolutely the case. And I say to the Honourable Member from from Orkney, I do believe in devolution. I was a member of the Scottish Constitutional Commission that drew up the proposals. But I, like many people involved in that time, also respect the right of the Scottish people to become a self-governing nation if they so wish. And I think it is disingenuous to say that just because we support independence, that means that we are not genuine in our desire to protect devolution. Mr Speaker, I will take your admonishment and I will finish there, even though I have so much more to say. Sure you have. Uh, Not admonition, but I just want to accommodate colleagues. Stephen Kerr. Mr Mr. Speaker, castigating the Tories for a power grab of repatriated powers while acting like a fifth column for the EU in Scotland has left the SNP in the ludicrous position of demanding powers from Theresa May that Nicola Sturgeon promises an independent Scotland will hand back to Jean-Claude Juncker. Those are the words of Jim Sellers, former deputy leader of the SNP, with the current deputy leader present in the chamber. It's appropriate to mention there is, Mr Speaker, no such thing as a power grab. It is a myth that devolution settlement is not being undermined or overturned or dismantled. Devolution is not being destroyed by this process. It is being enhanced. I repeat, powers 
now held in Brussels are returning to Edinburgh. And I would not countenance anything less, as I, the, with the zeal of a convert in the principle of devolution. My party uh, in power has a proud record, track record, of delivering more powers to the Scottish Parliament, and safeguards are in place to ensure that the powers we are repatriating as we leave the European Union flow to Edinburgh to make our powerful Parliament even more powerful. I voted last week for more powers for our Parliament. The SNP voted against those new powers. If the SNP in Edinburgh could even begin to get their arms around the powers they already have and use them to the benefit of Scotland. They promised an independent Scotland in 18 months, but they can't get to grips with social security powers past the Hoyt until 2021. They say they can create an independent Scotland for £400 million, but have budgeted £200 million to set up the Scottish social security system. And they have to spend £180 million on a computer system to manage farm payments. And they still are failing. But we are told there is a power grab, and that is absolutely gobsmacking. Let me be frank, Mr Speaker. The, um, with the time very much against me, I say, I truly believe that my on right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, has the goodwill of the vast majority of the people of our country. And by that, I mean Scotland. She has a difficult and complex task in hand, but she is being principled and pragmatic. We are leaving the European Union, the customs union and the single market. And this House should, if I may paraphrase the common sentiment of the people of Stirling, just get on with it. Mr yeah. Blackman. Very much, Mr Speaker. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, thank you for granting this debate and thank you to my, my colleague, um, the leader of our group, for applying well, for this comrade. debate. Mr Speaker, but this debate comes too late. The reason that this comes too late is because... The government MPs have already voted through this clause. It cannot now be amended because yep. of the way that the procedures of this place work. Yep. Mr Speaker, in Scotland, we believe that the people of Scotland are sovereign. Yeah. Yeah. In Westminster, in, in this place, they believe that Parliament is sovereign. Yeah. And actually, that is being attacked right now. Yep. The Prime Minister said, <coughs> only at the weekend, that Parliament cannot tie the hands of government. Surely that is the job of Parliament, yeah. Mr Speaker. If Parliament <laughs> cannot tie the hands of government, and it just power is being so far removed from where it should be. Yeah. It should yeah. be. Yeah. This is the fundamental difference, Mr Speaker, between the two countries. We in Scotland believe in democracy and we believe it should rest with the people, not the power of the executive. It is impossible to overstate the fundamental shift in the relationship between the Westminster and Scottish parliaments that has been caused by the actions of the UK Government last week. The Government talk about Scotland, the Scottish Parliament being the most powerful devolved parliament in the world. If it is the most powerful devolved parliament in the world, and yet its powers can be removed at the whim of the UK Government, I try to see what the, I try to think what the powers of the other parliaments are like, if they are less powerful than ours in Scotland. Mr Speaker, since I came here, I have been shocked at Westminster's attitude to Scotland. I've, I, I was under the impression, as a Scottish Nationalist MP, uh, as a Scottish Nationalist member, that Westminster didn't care very much for Scotland and tended to overrule the, the will of the Scottish people. And then I came here and I discovered that they don't even think about Scotland. Uh -huh, exactly. They put forward legislation yeah. like the EU withdrawal bill and we say, what about Scotland? And they look at you Same like a rabbit in the headlights. Uh, exactly, like, yes. What are you talking Correct. about? Yeah. Yeah. They do not even consider... Yep. The people of Scotland and the this fact that we are a separate country and we have different off. views. Yeah, we did not yeah, support yeah. Brexit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mr Speaker, what yeah. does the UK Government imagine that it's people you, outside it's this it's place it's think it's of their behaviour? Are they proud of their legacy? Are they proud of the fact that in years to come, people will look back at this UK government, at their behaviour last week, at the fact that they did not even allow a debate on this matter, and at the fact that in the face of the Scottish Parliament refusing legislative consent, they have, they have pounded on anyway, they have taken away powers from the Scottish Parliament. This will go down in history, Mr Speaker. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Democratically elected members of Parliament have the right to express their views on behalf of their constituents and air their political views on a wide range of subjects before they are voted on. The recording of the dissent is important, otherwise the records would show that everyone agrees and that apathy would prevail. And that is why the suppression of the voices of the SNP MPs in the House of Commons last week is a travesty. The Conservative Government used the process of this House to silence the dissenting voices who were not allowed to voice or disapproval, and that is a dangerous path to go down. When it came to a vote, the Scottish Labour abstained on matters that have been fundamental to the devolution settlements since 1999. The yeah. Scottish Conservatives, on the other hand, voted for the Westminster Power Grab. The ah. great joy they took in doing so just had to be seen to be believed. Yeah. And by denying the Scottish Government the powers coming back from the EU, they limit the ability of Scotland to fulfil its potential. The Show Convention, the unwritten rule that Westminster would not legislate and devolve matters in Scotland without the consent of the Scottish Parliament, is now worthless. <laughs> Previously, it was considered unthinkable that Show would ever be overturned. In the aftermath of Scotland's 2014 referendum, the Smith Commission was initiated to placate the Scottish voters who voted against independence but wanted more powers for the Scottish Parliament. The Commission was achieved agreement from all five of the participating Scottish political parties, including the Tories, that the Sioux Convention would be put on a statutory footing. Yet here we are today, yep. reading the Sioux Convention's epitaph because the UK Government couldn't care less about what the Scottish Parliament actually wants. In that void of respect, we instead have a constant demand for Scotland to trust the UK Government. Trust us to deliver an untouchable Sioux Convention enshrined in law. Trust us that voting no to independence is the best way for Scotland to stay in the EU. Trust us that we want Scotland to lead within the UK. Let me be very clear that the anger and the frustration in Scotland is rising, and it would be naive to think it is only SNP or independent supporters who feel that way. As Brexit Britain staggers from one calamity to another, the electorate of Scotland is no longer prepared to accept that. Trust us, we know what is best for you attitude that is emanating from the halls of West power in Westminster. Ultimately, this debate is really about one thing control. The UK Government wants the ability to act on behalf of Scotland, irrespective of whether or not the Scottish people have given their consent. Mr Speaker, in conclusion, in the last few months we have seen an unprecedented attack on Scotland's distinct political identity. If the UK Government continues on its present course, then they do so at their own peril. It will not be long before the Scottish people decide that independence may be the only way to genuinely protect our political institutions. Thank you. Martin Whitfield. Mr. Speaker, my predecessor J.P. McIntosh shared with his great friend Donald Dewar a passion, a passionate commitment for the cause of Scottish devolution, even before many people articulated it. As Donald Dewar said, articulating McIntosh's view, devolution is at its core about democratic control. It's about empowering people. It is not for the nationalistic glorification of the nation. It was never Scotland right or wrong. It is about good government. It is about equitable democracy that borrows, elevates and creates opportunity for the citizen. So where are we today? I look to the Secretary of State opposite and when I asked the question of him, why can't he have talks, he said that there had to be a precondition and that was that something was brought to the table. I say to you at this stage, in all honesty, I think that the people who look upon this House, both from England and Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland want a little bit more. I think you should offer talks without any preconditions. We have heard today that they would be accepted by the Scottish Government and I think that that is a way forward. The Sewell Convention is one that speaks of respect and respect that needs to be shown by all parties. We have more in common. So sit down and talk without precondition or planned stunts. The people of the United Kingdom demand that of this place. The people of the constituency I represent demand it. And as is written on the threshold of the Donald Dewar Room in Holyrood, it is not beyond the wit of man to devise institutions to make it so. That's the way to do it. And Stuart Malcolm MacDonald. I have to say, somewhat confused by Scottish Conservative members, indeed the Secretary of State, being so aghast at the idea that Scotland could be in a partnership in the United Kingdom. It could never be in a partnership, according to the State Secretary, because in doing some research, I found the government's white paper from the last majority Tory government before devolution called Scotland and the Union a partnership for good. So it used to actually believe, be the case that the Tories believed Scotland was in a partnership, in an 
in looking up, Mr. Speaker, some of the things that paper presented by the then State Secretary, Mr. Lang, it had a few interesting things to say. First of all, it says in its European section that Scotland is poised to benefit enormously from the single market. That apparently is now not to be the case. But there's a really interesting part in here, rather dry to some I admit, on parliamentary procedure. And I'll quote it. It says, It is often the case that there is insufficient time in its crowded schedule for, in Parliament for Scottish affairs. It is also suggested from time to time that there are few opportunities for proper debate on Scottish issues. Well, Mr Speaker, the more things change, the more they stay the same. The dogs in the street have even worked that one out. But in reading the Hansard at the time of the Secretary's statement to the House, the then member for Aberdeen South, uh, Mr Robertson, said that the dynamic and the dynamism and the change of the union is the only reason it Survives. Well, they were wrong then, Mr Speaker, and they're wrong now. It's hard to believe that the State Secretary has laboured away for two years, and this is what he's now come up with. He looks to me a haunted figure, and so he might, although he has the spring in his step there. Because isn't it quite remarkable that 11 of his Scottish colleagues have all turned up this evening, presumably to eye up the poison chalice that is the office of the Secretary of State for Scotland, so he should feel like a haunted figure. But I say this to him, and he's a man, he is a man I like, he is a man who has helped me on occasion. He has messed this up and messed this up big time. And I think he knows that himself. Indeed, I also want to say to Scottish Conservative members, they could learn something from the Right Honourable Lady from Broxtow and our so-called Brexit rebel colleagues. When they are conned by the government, what do they do? They show some muscle. They flex some muscle. And in response to a con, what do we get from the Scottish Conservatives? Nothing but a supine approach to Parliament. So on that basis, every one of them Every one of them is qualified beyond belief to take up the position yes. to be the next Secretary of State for Scotland. Mr Speaker, this is a government in search of an empire. Scotland will have no part in it. Yes. You'll see, Macdonald. Two minutes. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Secretary of State called for perspective. From my perspective, what happened last week was that the British Constitution and the devolved settlement was unilaterally rewritten by the government in the blink of an eye. In Australia, a power grab like the one we saw last Tuesday couldn't just be bulldozed through Parliament. It would require a double majority in a referendum of Australian citizens. If we were in Canada, such a power grab would need resolutions in both the Senate and the House of Commons, and then resolutions in the Legislative Assemblies of at least two-thirds of the provinces, resolutions that could not then be ignored. In the US, such a power grab would need two-thirds majorities in both the Senate and the House, or two-thirds of the states, would need to call a convention and three-quarters of them agree to the proposals. Mr Speaker, the contrast with the shoddy process followed by the UK Government last week could not be starker. One Parliament unilaterally removing powers from another against its expressed wishes in a way that should not be countenanced in any self-respecting constitutional democracy. The Sewell Convention, as operated by the Government last week, is clearly not worth the paper it was eventually oh, yeah, put on. Yeah. In short, Mr Speaker, the UK Constitution is looking increasingly beyond repair. Um, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Mr Speaker. What happened last week was completely unacceptable, with deplorable antics from the Tories when it came to the time allowed for debate on one hand, and the counterproductive antics from the SNP, including walking out of this place in an orchestrated media stunt that further curtailed debate on the other. As the party that delivered devolution, Labour has been driving a sensible and constructive position throughout the process, exploring options to both safeguard and improve the devolution settlement as we leave the EU. Only Labour has been working constructively to try and break the deadlock between the UK Government and the Scottish Government. We tabled amendments to Clause 11 at every stage of the Bill, and the Tories voted them down every single time. We started in a position where the UK Government wanted 111 powers to be reserved to Westminster following our withdrawal from the EU. We got this down to 24 powers, which was clearly a substantial improvement, but we also respect that this was not seen as good enough by the Scottish Parliament. The Scottish Parliament's position, however, does not justify the SNP's vote on Tuesday night. Their vote was a vote for us to go back to the original position of 111 powers being reserved to Westminster. Can any of the SNP actually stand up in here today and defend that absurdity? The blame for this mess we are in lies squarely at the door of the UK Government. 
They have taken us to the brink of a constitutional crisis, despite repeated promises that clause 11 would be fixed in time for members of this House to debate it. Both the UK Government and the SNP are perfectly intent on in causing a constitutional crisis. It fits their narratives with the Tories trying to sow division in order to secure the Unionist vote and the SNP sowing division to appease their supporters and agitate for another independence referendum. The Tories have played directly into the SNP's hands on this. We know that the SNP are only interested in sowing division and talking about the Constitution. The Tories' complete inability to fix this mess that they created have allowed the SNP to claim that Scotland's voice is not being heard. Uh, it's an absurdity and I urge you to seek compromise as a matter of urgency. Christine Jardine. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, given the time delays, I will be brief, um, which is not a phrase my colleagues hear often. <laughs> um, tonight's debate has been important for devolution, for the future of Scottish governance and for the future of all of our governance. But it has also been profoundly disappointing because rather than make progress, we have simply demonstrated the problems which got us here in the first place. And transigents on both sides dug into positions pro and anti devolution and conservative, and the red mists of nationalism descend on both sides whenever devolution is discussed. I have to disagree, however, with my honourable friend from Aberdeen North. It is not too late. We should perhaps listen to the Shadow Secretary of State for Scotland and get back round the table. And what I and my party would like to see is the opportunity taken to create an enduring dispute resolution procedure which would prevent us coming to this stage again and getting to the point which my right honourable friend from Orkney and Shetland described and I have experienced and I'm sure many others in this House have, speaking to constituents and businesses across the country who say what will happen next? And we have to say we don't know. Can we please abandon the positions and get on with finding a solution? Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Thank you. Patricia Gibson. My remarks are very truncated, so I'll simply um, reserve my remarks to the following. What happened last week was a clear attempt to strangle Scotland's voice, to put us back in our box, to yeah, silence yeah. Scotland's Parliament, to ensure that we eat our cereal. Yeah. Mr yeah. Speaker, we will not eat our cereal. We will stand up for Scotland, and it's time yeah. the Secretary of State for Scotland did the same. Yeah. To be the voice of Scotland in the Cabinet, not a Tory apologist for Scotland. <coughs> The Tories have precipitated this crisis, but they will learn one thing and they will learn it the hard way. This is not, in Scotland, Westminster does not carry the affection that the Scottish Parliament does. Yeah. We will stand up for Scotland because the people of Scotland know that in Scotland they are sovereign. Yeah. Thank you. Order. The question is that this House has considered the validity of the Sewell Convention. As many as are of that opinion say aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. <laughs> Division, clear the lobby. Order. The question is that this House has considered the validity of the Sewell Convention. As many as have that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. no. 
Tell us for the eyes, Wendy Morton and Mike Freer. Tell us for the nose, Mrs. Marion Fellows and Mr. David Linden.
Order, order. The eyes to the right, 88. The nose to the left, 51. Thank you. The eyes to the right, 88. The nose to the left, 51. So the eyes have it, the eyes have it. Unlock. Thank you. Order, we now come to the motion on EU trade agreements. And not moved. Uh, point of order, Mr. Ian Blackford. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, we firstly thank you for the debate that we've had this yeah. evening. This is an important juncture in Scotland's constitutional history. I asked a question in debate as to whether or not the government would bring forward emergency legislation in order that it would respect <laughs> the wishes of the Scottish Parliament. And moreover, we've now had a division in this House where the majority of Scottish MPs have voted to show their lack of uh, acceptance of what has happened by voting against the motion. And once again, Scotland has been outvoted because Conservative yep. MPs who yep. weren't yep. in the debate yep. have come in here and have outvoted those that have been sent to represent the interests of Scotland. Can I ask your assistance in what I may do in order to take this matter forward so we can ensure that the UK Government listens to the legitimate demands of the people of Scotland through the Scottish Government? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, nothing disorderly has happened this evening. If the Honourable Gentleman is asking what can he do, the answer is persist through interrogation and argument. And knowing the Right Honourable Gentleman as I do, I know that he will require no further encouragement from me. We come now to the debate on acquired brain injury, the general debate on acquired brain injury, and I call the Minister to move, Minister Steve Bright.